Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Zheng Huadong from Huawei NUAS Arc Lab. Today, my colleagues, my friends will share the tutorial about the mapping modality pre-training and the generalization for recommendation system. And the speakers include uh, Dr. Zhu Jieming, Dr. Wu Zhuhan, and Professor Zhang Rui, and uh, uh, Dr. Hua myself. Oh, here is the outline of the tutorial, and uh, I will spend about uh, 25 minutes to introduce the, the tutorial and uh, several industry challenges in recommendation system. And uh, this is the motivation of our tutorial. As we know, the classic recommendation models are trained by the ID features, category features. And that's kind of uh, data we can, uh, for example, the user ID, item ID, uh, user gender, user demographic information, and the item category information. That's kind of data are very good at modeling the collaborative filtering signals. But they are always overlook the raw data, the raw content data, like the text information, image information, audio and video. And along with the fast development of the pre-training generation technology, such as large language model, Clip, there are many very good products like ChatGPT, DALI, and which offer the new opportunities in understanding the users uh, and items. And it gave us the chance to de develop better recommendation systems. And we would like to share our research about uh, the uh, multimodality recommendation system. And we also will share some industry practice, some challenges, and uh, there are very interesting research questions. Uh, we can see the four research questions. How to enhance the recommendation with multimodal pre-training technology? And how to align the, uh, and fuse the user preference modality to other content modality? and how to generate the personalized content for each individual users. Now, finally, we will share some experience about multimodal technology in recommendation system. And this is the main content, and the main content corresponds to the research questions I present before. And here is speakers. And I will spend about 30 minutes to do the introduction and introduce our team and several challenges in our recommendation system. And Dr. Jieming will spend about 25 minutes to introduce the multi-modality uh, pre-training and applications in recommendation system. And Professor Zhang Rui will introduce the multi-model generation for personalization. And finally, Dr. Wu Chuhan will introduce some uh, practice, some experience, uh, some good experience, uh, some building uh, uh, experience about the recommendation system in the products. And uh, we have two kinds of audience. The first audience come from the multi-modality learning community. And uh, the tutorial will offer the insight into, uh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, uh, online, um, can you hear me? Hello. Okay, I will, I will near to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, and uh, we have two kinds of community. The first, uh, we have two kinds of audience. <laughs> the first audience mainly come from the multimodal learning uh, community. And the tutorial will offer them the insight about the, uh, how to integrate uh, multimodality technology into the recommendation system. And we will introduce several practice and challenges. And uh, the second uh, uh, audience are the um, people from the recommendation community and the, uh, the tutorial will present uh, the knowledge about the recent uh, progress in multimodality and the generation technology and how to apply them to enhance the recommendation system. Uh, of course, uh, people from other community also welcome to our tutorial. Okay. And uh, uh, because most of speakers come from Huawei, come from Huawei NUAS Art Lab. So I will briefly introduce our team. And uh, Huawei's vision is bring digital to every person, home, organization, who are, who are fully connected in the intelligent world. 
and the Huawei Master Arc Lab is the Huawei's intelligent lab. So we hope to help Huawei to build an intelligent world. Uh, as we know, AI have many directions. So we have seven sub lab, computer vision lab, decision making and reasoning lab, AI theory lab, uh, NLP lab, recommendation and search lab, AI system lab, and AI application lab. And uh, our, the locations of our lab all over the world include China, Singapore, UK, and so on and so forth. And uh, we come from the recommendation and the search lab. The goal of our lab is to get the right information to the right people. Uh, as we know, the, uh, the history of recommendation system have more than 30 years. Uh, maybe in 1994, uh, the first collaborative technology work, uh, new, the GoPlans, the paper in CCW, and uh, it's the beginning of the recommendation system. And we found that the academic research and the industry practice are the two wheels of the recommendation system. On the one side, uh, our team would like to collaborate with our product team, and the product team can provide us the design, the scenario, and uh, we can apply the advanced AI technology to improve the recommendation system. We can uh, validate our products, our algorithms. On the other side, we, like, we would like to learn from best and uh, we collaborate with the uh, academia and uh, we also do some interesting uh, research about the recommendation. I will introduce, introduce them later. And uh, many friends ask me <laughs> why Huawei uh, do research about the recommendations uh, system. Because as we know, uh, we have uh, Huawei mobile phone as well, especially in mainland of China. So in each day, there are millions, uh, hundreds of millions of users use a mobile phone. And uh, every Huawei mobile phone, we pre-install several apps, such as Huawei Apple Store, Game Center, audio, video, music, book, browsing, news feed app. So in each day, hundreds of millions of users can use our recommendation service, and we can recommend the millions of items to that kind of users. On the other hand, in the past 10 years, and we also some impactful research to contribute the recommendation community. Uh, for example, the recommendation model structure, we have DeepFM and PN AutoML for recommendation system. And uh, uh, some brands know, I, I have some research about the causal recommendation, the counterfactual recommendation, intervention recommendation, and we ha also have many diverse work in recommendation system. Uh, I will introduce them later. And we also have, uh, in the recent two years, large learning model is quite popular. And uh, we also do some research about uh, how to apply large learning model to improve the recommendation, like Noah Bird and the large learning model for CTR. And we also have several uh, nice survey paper about uh, this area. And uh, as we know, the benchmark is quite important in the recommendation community. And uh, uh, benchmark is about the data set benchmark, it's about the algorithm side benchmark. And uh, we published the full CTR bars, uh, simple X, and the, the regional data side for explanation. And, uh, uh, Based on the, our company's mission and the opportunities for practice and our research ex experience, our practice in the industry, we summarize the several challenges in the industry recommendation system. There are mainly two kinds of uh, challenges. We summarize the in three category, problem, method, and goals. And I will introduce them one by one. The first challenger is the missing information. And the recommendation system is different from other machine learning tasks. In recommendation system, we always miss a lot of information. We miss features, we miss samples. For the missing features, for example, uh, my friend, Dr. Zhu Jieming told me, there is a very good movie, let's go to see the movie. But our recommendation system always don't know that signal. They don't know the information. So if we don't know the causal feature, we can't predict the, the user's behavior. We can't give the accurate recommendation system, uh, recommendation results. Uh, and for the missing samples, let's see the two examples. Uh, since, uh, for example, in Huawei App Store, we have millions of candidates app. 
But in one interaction, we can only expose tens of items to the users. We can only collect the user's behavior on the tens of apps, but we can't collect the user's behavior on other tabs. The other example is uh, uh, we know the user's behavior on Huawei App Store, but we don't know the user's behavior on other web on other app store. Maybe the user downloads the app from the Google Play, from the browser. So how to handle it? Uh, in the past five years, we tried to use the counter, uh, counter factual learning technology to, uh, to impute the user's behavior on the IELTS of samples. And we also try to predict uh, the missing features. But what else? There are many research opportunities in this kind of area. The second challenge is about the individual treatment effect. The research question is how to find the causal attribute of the user's decision. The decision like click rating and uh, uh, what's the meaning of the causal attribute? Uh, here is one example. Both user A and the user B like movie C, they give movie C five star. But A like movie C because of the director, B like the movie C because of the, act, uh, the actress. So the same attribute or treatment may have different effect on different users. We call it IT, individual treatment effect. We also can call it the causal attribute. I, uh, a curate attribute can help us to build better user profiles to do the plan, uh, explanation and improve the recommendation accuracy. And uh, uh, I'm lucky I have a chance to collaborate with uh, uh, Professor Gongzhi from Beijing University. And uh, uh, we have a method about a conditional counterfactual causal effect to compute individual treatment effect under some very straightforward uh, causal assumptions or lab assumptions, something like that. But we also need a more novel method to compute IGE and the more generalized uh, assumptions. And the third challenge, bias. In recommendation system, we have so many bias. The position bias, exposure bias, user self-selection bias, and the uh, uh, previous model selection bias, duration bias, something like that. Um, the reason of the bias come from, the bias come from the missing information I just talked before, uh, the confounders and the recommendation system is a closed feedback loop. And there are some solutions. Uh, in the past few years, we try to use the causal method to handle it. And uh, we make use the causal framework, the potential outwork framework. Uh, we have a survey paper here. And we, we can also to use the causal model to analyze this kind of uh, bias. And uh, we try to use some method like uh, inverse propensity score, IPS method, direct method, and the W Lopus method to mitigate these kind of bias. Here, we also have more research opportunities. For example, how to handle new bears, confounder bears, trust bears. And uh, Jamie is my friend. He told me that's a good movie. I trust the Jamie. And, uh, but maybe uh, that kind of recommendation is not good for me. And uh, how to collect unbiased data, how to train an unbiased model, and how to ev evaluate that kind of bears. And uh, the first challenge is the model reviewing. As we know, in industry recommendation system, we always need to update our recommendation model with very high frequency because we, uh, in each second, we have new item, we have new users. We must make use, uh, we must make use of the new data to make our recommendation system better. Um, but the history models are always underutilized. There are some solutions to use the history models, such as online learning, ensemble learning. And in the RecSys last year, we have a work about a model inverse the data synthetic framework. The basic idea is very simple. Data is model, model is data. For example, we use 1 million samples to train a recommendation model. Then we can use this kind of method to inverse tens of generate samples from the history model. And then we can combine the generated samples with the new samples together. We can train a powerful recommendation model. It's very efficiency. 
And uh, there are more research opportunities like uh, machine unlearning from Tsinghua University and uh, Lenware from Nanjing University. And we also think about can we train a large recommendation model like a large number model to remember people's behavior. So let's see our the first challenge, the large language model enhanced the recommendation. And as we know, the chat GPT uh, demonstrates the great capability of large language model is very good at the knowledge uh, interactions. How to make use of that technology to improve the recommendation? And uh, uh, our colleagues in Hawaii North Art Lab we have a very nice, pa uh, nice survey paper uh, to talk about that problem from two perspectives where and how. So the where, can we use large long model to enhance feature engineering, to enhance feature embedding, to enhance prediction function, and to do the better controller? And for the how, do we need to fine tune the large long model to generate the recommendation results? And do we need to collaborate, collab, collaborate the large long model with the classic models to generate recommendation system, recommendation results? Uh, our next challenge is uh, about the tutorial today, the multiple modality, and how to align the user's preference modality to the content modality. Uh, as I introduced before, the class recommendation system, uh, they train the model mainly with the user's preference modality, user's behavior, mm -hmm. and the uh, content modality like text, image, audio, video, they are very good at the content semantic understanding. But unfortunately, there is a huge gap between the two kinds of modality, user performance modality and the content modality. So um, a lot of people do a lot of work, but uh, for myself, I think uh, it doesn't work. The improve is uh, um, maybe it's very small. So how to handle it? I think we need to deeply understand about the different modality and their relationship to the user's preference, the user's decision. And we also need, uh, we also need to uh, train a recommendation focus on the pre-training model, which have the chance to bridge the gap. And the tutorial uh, today, we will, uh, we will introduce several methods about this area. And the next, uh, uh, challenge is about the simulation and how to model user preference with the simulation. Uh, as we know, the ACM UMAP user modeling and the personalization uh, is a very classic uh, research question. And the ACM UMAP have more than 30 years history, but user modeling is still very hard. And uh, because the people is complex, the context is very complex. <laughs> and the content, the item, the candidates is also very complex. And in uh, for, for our uh, experience, in some advertisement scenario, the CTR is less than 1%. So how to handle it? Uh, in the past one year, uh, there are many uh, simulation work. For example, a uh, record agent from Rim University. And that's a very interesting work. Um, I think it's a digital twin of recommendation system. It can simulate the user's behavior like browsing, chatting, broadcasting. And uh, uh, it also generates uh, the recommendation results to the user and simulate the user's feedback to the generator recommendation results. And it can collect the user's behavior. And if the simulation is is uh, it's actually the accuracy of simulation is very high. So we can do the uh, maybe counterfactual data augmentation or simulation data augmentation. Um, there are more research opportunities there. For example, how to simulate more users, more behaviors efficiently and accurately, and uh, how to evaluate this kind of simulation. There are many work to do. The eighth uh, challenge uh, is about the lifetime value modeling and how to predict uh, the user's long-term satisfaction. And most of recommendation studies, especially the industry recommendation studies, they focus on optimize the short-term objective, like click rating, the wild time. And uh, we, there is a gap between the short-term objective and the long-term objective. And we would like to model the user's experience, model the user's long-term satisfaction, and uh, we have a tutorial last year in the Rexis 
we introduce the definition of and and the scenario of uh, lifetime value. And we also introduce uh, typical lifetime value prediction technology and some product uh, practice. But there are still uh, many work to do. For example, the uh, lifetime modeling, we have some challenger like delay, sparse feedback, the code star problem, and the offline valuation problem. We need to do multi-task optimization to improve the user's experience. Okay, the next one is about the trust words. How to build the trust words recommendation. And in our company, we define the trust words from eight perspective, like accountability, security, safety, fairness, privacy, robustness, transparency, assisting people, serving people, and the long-term enhance the happiness of human society environment. But most of current recommendation system, they focus only on the accuracy. We use the metrics like AUC, log loss, CTR, ECPM to evaluate our recommendation system. Of course, they are not enough to be a trustworthy recommendation. And we also hope the scholars can help us, can help industry to define what is the trustworthy. It, it may be a combined research direction, and we need the uh, scholars from society, economy, um, HCI, and uh, uh, many other um, domain to help us to build the trustworthy recommendation. Okay, okay. our last challenge is about the Wing Yun ecosystem. The recommendation research question is, uh, uh, how to satisfy multi-stakeholders in dialogue-based IR or recommendation system. And uh, uh, as we know, the information system mainly have four kinds of stakeholder, the user, the content provider, the information system, and the advertisers. Dialogue-based IR or recommendation system can directly offer the answer to the users, which can satisfy the user requirement. It's very good. But there are many challenges for each stakeholders. For example, for a content provider, how to protect their IP, how to protect their benefits. And for the advertisers, during the dialogue, how to appropriately to expose the advertisement to the users. And for the users, how to ensure the generated item, the generated information is objective, is accountable. And for the information system, recommendation system, and the search engine, how to design win-win interaction and merchantism for long-term benefits. Okay, here is the summary about the 10 uh, challenges. And we also do some work before. For example, uh, I have keynotes in a CGI workshop about how to debase with causal method. And we also have a, a tutorial about lifetime value modeling last year in Rexis. And uh, in, last, in last December, uh, I also have a keynote in ICDM workshop about how to use the uh, fairness technology to improve the uh, fairness of the recommendation system. But there are many work to do. And today, um, my colleagues and I will share some experience about a multi, a multiple modality in recommendation system. So we also to desire to collaborate with the talented people, and we hope to change the world. Um, we hope to do wonderful recommendation research. So uh, maybe we have uh, we have some minutes to uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. So any questions? Okay, if there is no questions, uh, let's uh, move on. The next speaker is Dr. Zhu Jieming. Okay, Jieming, it's your time. Okay, <laughs> please. Thank you, Zunfa, for your presentation. And okay, so my question you. is uh, from Huawei's perspective and uh, from this list of challenges. 
uh, which one or which of three challenges is the most important in the problem? Oh, yeah, it's a great uh, question. Yeah, uh, for my understanding, uh, not for Huawei, <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, misinformation is uh, the may maybe the biggest challenge. Yeah, uh, as we know, in for the video task, and uh, we know that picture is a dog, that picture is a cat. We don't we don't miss information, but uh, uh, in recommendation system, we always miss information, the features, uh, the samples, the context information. And uh, sometimes uh, we can't use that some data because the private, uh, private uh, issues. And in European, we have the uh, GDPR. So uh, it's very hard to predict the user's preference uh, accurately. Yeah, that is my understanding. And uh, uh, because why mobile phone sells well, as I mentioned, and uh, we also think maybe we can um, do the local model on the device and the user's data. Um, we don't uh, transfer the user's data to the cloud and uh, we can pre pre protect the user's information there. So I think missing information is quite important and there is also a rich research area. <laughs> Cool. I, I agree with you. I'm from industry as well. Cool. And this information uh, is one of our most important problem. And we try to uh, elevate, or maybe we can't 100% solve it, but we can uh, elevate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and another interesting is I would, I would like to mention is if we don't miss information, we know everything about the user. Uh, the recommendation system is also very hard because the people is very complex and uh, we don't know the people's idea in their brain so uh, in some kind it's also one kind of uh, way we can call it missing information yeah people it's complex the context is complex and the people are always uh, uh, easy to be influenced yeah okay thank you for your question <laughs> Okay, if there's no question, let's move to next speaker. <laughs> okay, Jimmy. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Zhu from Huawei. I'd like to introduce a uh, uh, talk about multi-mode pre-training for nursing. Okay. Nowadays, multi-mode models are reshaping the world with uh, a new understanding, creation, and interaction capabilities. Uh, let's say some uh, examples. For multi-mode understanding, we know uh, models such as Blue 2 uh, mean to be full, uh, and something like that can recognize an uh, image uh, given it uh, as an input to the model. For example, uh, in this figure, it can describe the environment, the uh, objects in the figure. And uh, also, uh, models such as GPT-4 can make good reasoning about the uh, image. Uh, given a uh, rectangle uh, image, uh, the model can know it is unusual because a man is standing on the back door of the uh, moving car and it is uh, iron uh, clothes, so it is very uh, unusual. The second task is about the cross model retrieval. Uh, given a pre training um, multi mode models, uh, different modalities can be aligned into a union uh, space. So uh, we can retrieve uh, image using text, and also we can retrieve text using image. 
the most popular models in this domain is Clip. Uh, it uh, can support uh, very good uh, quality uh, image to uh, text retrieval. And also, in this domain, we can find a new uh, improvement in this uh, task. It is the image band. Image band uh, align among about six modalities together. So it can also uh, support the image to audio retrieval or audio to image retrieval. The most, the most promising task is about the multiple generation. So with the uh, prevalence of, of models such as table depletion and the new coming uh, Sora, uh, text to image generation and text to video generation has become uh, more sure. uh, It has also become uh, a good application in mastery. For example, we can apply such uh, techniques in news cover generation and also news title generation or some ad advertisement generation. So in the multi-mode domain, we have found more and more applications. However, in the research area, most studies are uh, studying areas such as multi-mode understanding, multi-mode understanding, uh, uh, multi-mode classification, So uh, this task, however, are different from our problem. Uh, since recommendation is a special vertical domain, uh, so uh, we are interested in what can multi-mode multi -mode, mode, uh, sorry, multi -mode models help for recommendation task. This is different from existing work. Uh, however, uh, in this domain, we uh, have very few uh, studies in uh, this Literature. So, in this tutorial, we want to uh, summarize uh, some of the uh, work in this area and want to contribute more and call for more contributions in the community. This is the outline of my uh, tutorial talk. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce some typical general domain multiple filtering text techniques. Uh, we divide so it into three types of uh, techniques, uh, including pre-training tasks and uh, different uh, pre-training modalities. And uh, finally, I introduced some uh, popular pre-training models that have been used in multiple understanding domain. And then we are interested in uh, how to make such pre-training models for recommendation tasks. So uh, how to perform the pre-training task is very important. We will introduce the vertical domain data about the text domain, image domain, and uh, the interaction modes. And then we divide the task into different types of pre training tasks. And uh, some, uh, some training recommendation tasks we will also um, be introduced. And finally, I will uh, give some uh, open challenges and opportunities that we can make in this topic. Uh, for general domain, much more briefly, uh, there are three uh, topics. Uh, the first is a pre-training task. So uh, we brought, broadly uh, classify it into three types, reconstructive, uh, constructive, and generative. And uh, also, we uh, divide the work uh, along with different modalities. Uh, such as new text uh, recommendation uh, rely mostly on text, and the uh, uh, video recommendation uh, rely more on uh, vision information. And uh, we also have music recommendation in Huawei. Uh, so uh, audio recommendation is also one of our uh, uh, topics. And uh, then I'd like to introduce some preaching models that is very popular and have been deployed in some uh, companies such as Clip, Clip2, ImageBand, and Unified IO2, which I think uh, the techniques introduced by these models are very representative. 
So the first one uh, is how to uh, make uh, sub supervised training uh, from uh, an emergence of the first uh, self supervised training has become quite uh, popular. So uh, here I'd like to classify the paradigms into three types. The first one is reconstructive. So in the first figure, we can say given the input, we want to reconstruct uh, some of the tokens or features uh, from it. So this type of uh, reconstruction uh, is the uh, application of uh, birth. And another type of reconstruction is the whole reconstruction, such as the diffusion in the reconstruct uh, image uh, input into a uh, reconstructed image. Uh, it uses the VE architecture. And the second type is the constructive uh, framework. Uh, in this framework, uh, we have different encoders for different modalities. So here we can use constructive laws for some alignment tasks to align different modalities into a common space. Uh, now, typical models include clip image band. They can support uh, retrieval uh, across different modalities. So uh, for uh, cross modality retrieval and also for uh, some tasks uh, relying on image embedding, uh, these types of models are very popular. And a third type of uh, uh, retrieval is the uh, autoregressive generation the task the models include GPT and DALI. So uh, here, uh, the GPT focuses more on the token uh, generation, and the DALI uh, focuses on the image token generation. However, uh, the good thing is that the autoregressive generation have the uh, cap capability of model scaling. So when we scale the model size, and with more uh, data and laws will become smaller. So here, uh, the most uh, promising framework may be an autoregressive generation framework, and we want to uh, research on. Uh, here is a summarizing of the prediction model models uh, from 2019 to 2020. Here, uh, most of the models are and the follow-ups of, uh, of the uh, bird and the uh, clip. So uh, the most uh, of them are using techniques such as reconstructive and uh, contrastive uh, frameworks. And the representative ones, including VR bird, uh, Ulic, uh, and also clip, MU, M M6, uh, and Wukong, and, uh, which is provided by uh, Huawei. And uh, I mentioned that this representative works because uh, uh, they have been uh, used in some recommendation tasks uh, and have been evaluated. They, are, they work uh, in our production systems. So in these models, uh, they follow the common paradigm of pre-training class function. Uh, and this is the most uh, useful uh, framework uh, in a bird area. So uh, in a pre-training stage, uh, each modality can be encoded uh, using their corresponding modality encoder into uh, representation. And these different representations can be filled together by a fusing uh, module. And uh, in this uh, uh, framework, uh, they have two uh, components, the modality encoders and the fusion modules. Uh, and uh, during the uh, fine-tuning stage, uh, usually we fine-tune uh, the fusion modules, and uh, sometimes the modality encoders are freeze. So uh, following these types of fusion and fine-tuning, uh, we have many recommendation-related work. Uh, however, with the uh, prevalence of GPT, so uh, many uh, multiple language models have uh, become uh, popular. 
here in the survey about the mod model, not, not the models, we can say from 2023 to 2024, the, uh, we have an abundance of mod model, marginal grade models, and the research area is growing. growing. Uh, however, with the uh, uh, mod model, large language models, we have a different learning burden. That is from working, um, and also we can use in contact learning. Uh, from plotting uh, is a, a very uh, efficient way to instruct the large model to perform uh, some specific tasks, uh, especially on LLM. Uh, however, in addition to basic promotion, we have two variants. The first is in contact learning. Uh, in, in contact learning, we can construct a uh, few uh, demonstrations that is some uh, uh, specific examples given to the uh, um, and then the night model can uh, make some uh, a quick in text learning to uh, to reason about the relationship between x and y and uh, output similar logics. And the other type of variant is the uh, chain of thought promotion. And this type of technique is centered on user's approach to help the um, to uh, get more uh, reasoning ability uh, to uh, on a specific task, especially conversation task. So we can help them um, to uh, self improve the results of the output. And then I'd like to introduce some representative models uh, of the large model, large language models. So the first half is in the uh, pre training, uh, fine training framework. So, the first one is ULIT. This one has been uh, integrated into the Alibaba's Easy Rack framework and has been de deployed in production. Uh, and in this model, uh, there are three uh, types of tasks for pre training. The first one is the uh, mask language modeling. Uh, Okay, the first one is the mask language modeling, and the second is the mask region modeling. And the third is the alignment between the text and image. However, uh, in addition to the global constructive learning, it also has uh, the world region alignment, that is the local relationship alignment. And uh, however, okay. Uh, however, uh, uh, the model uh, has not become uh, popular uh, after the emergence of CLIP because the pre-training is still on um, uh, media skills data. Uh, the CLIP, however, uh, only rely on a global matching between the text and the image. Uh, the model is quite simple uh, compared to the unit. However, uh, it has been trained on a large scale data set and the quality has become better. Uh, given the uh, patient clip, it uh, not only can output a recognition of the text and the image, it can also be used uh, with the clone techniques to make a few short or one short uh, classification, image classification. And uh, with the uh, success of clip, uh, there are also some other uh, variants in the text of audio uh, domain. And the clap is to align the text to the audio. For example, in our music presentation program, we can use clap to align the uh, music audio and the music text, such as the descriptions and then the uh, uh, lyrics. And the first, first one is the image band. The image band has aligned six uh, modalities. However, during training, 
it was also used the pairwise modality as a uh, supervised signals uh, after training. Uh, uh, one modalities can be aligned to the image uh, modality. So uh, it supports uh, any to any retrieval between any two modalities. Uh, recently, we also worked on image band to deliver uh, code based uh, image band variant. So we can uh, deliver better uh, retrieval quality uh, in, contrast, in contrast to uh, the image band. The other type is the RLM based uh, multimode models. Uh, we here I introduce two of them. The first one is blue cube. Uh, the blue cube uh, is uh, first uh, usually the, the the first work to align the image encoder and the um, decoder. We can set both the image encoder from clip and the um, decoder such as number two, uh, something like that, a uh, phrase. However, we can train uh, adapter that can connect the image output to the um, decode. Uh, decode. Uh, it can use the image tokens as the input of the. Um, so, in this way, we can uh, take image tokens as another language. Okay. So, uh, after a, a uh, input, it into an uh, um, decoder, uh, it can be taken as a type of soft term. So the uh, um, decoder can recognize uh, what happened in the image. So this type of framework has uh, become quite, quite popular nowadays. And many uh, multi-mode multi language models uh, follow this way to align uh, text text modality to image modality. And uh, uh, following this blue tube, uh, a lot of work, Unified uh, IO2, okay. The Unified IO2 published recently, uh, also is an improvement of Unified IO. The basic motivation of Unified IO is to build a framework to input any modality and output any modality. However, the basic backbone of the uh, encoder decoder part is shared. So we can say uh, using different modality encoders, we can tokenize the text uh, image and uh, other modalities into tokens. These tokens can be uh, vectors or uh, discrete codes. Uh, then we can use a uh, uh, GPT like uh, model to output another sequence of uh, tokens. So the first part is the uh, image tokens, uh, text tokens. We can use it to uh, construct the new text. And then the other uh, modality uh, is the image. We can output some image tokens. And uh, when plugging with a, a vacuum gun decoder, you can draw some figures and uh, use these figures to reconstruct the input images. And the third type is audio. And uh, the audio stream can also be tokenized into some history. Uh, tokens and then this framework, this uh, modalities can share a single uh, framework unified IO. So uh, these types of multi mode uh, um, uh, very re representative uh, in a way they align different modalities into a common, uh, common backbone. So uh, this types of framework can simplify how we process different modalities uh, in um, applications. For example, uh, we have different uh, domains in Huawei. For example, music recommendation 
radio recommendation and uh, news recommendation. You could want to train the live model uh, using multi domain data. We can uh, pre process with multiple, uh, multiple data into a common space such as we tokenize each mo modality into a token sequence. And we share the token space and uh, then we can build a virtual domain GPT. And uh, this is our ongoing work uh, following this paradigm. Okay, next I want to introduce some uh, work on multimodal training for recommendation. And the first is uh, uh, what uh, domain data we have. So uh, we have uh, raw item contents that may not be trained in uh, prediction models. And then we have some uh, user behavior sequence that are uh, very uh, popular in recommendation domain. And then we can build the user item graphs, and uh, there are also some uh, knowledge graphs in recommendation programs. And uh, the in domain training task include uh, some constructive recommendation learning, mask item prediction, and next item prediction, and so on. And there are some uh, recommendation specific uh, downstream tasks such as user tagging, item tagging. And we can use the multi mode techniques for different uh, stages of recommendation, such as matching. We can build a sequential recommendation models. And for CTR prediction, we can use them as additional features. It can be applied in the ranking stage. And for re-ranking, we can uh, use the multiple uh, recommendations to enhance diversity of our recommended list. And here I show some examples uh, for of multiple recommendation scenarios, especially in uh, Huawei. And the first is the new speed recommendation in a Huawei mobile phone use uh, a browser. And the second is micro video recommendation. It can be uh, sliced one by one and uh, watch the short video. And the third is the music recommendation. We have the music app, however, different from other types of uh, recommendation. The music streaming is uh, uh, stream continuous. So uh, even uh, people that didn't uh, focus on listening to music, uh, it, we also can get you know, results, uh, the feedbacks from the uh, uh, app because uh, and, uh, the streaming is performed uh, continuous. And then the first one is the mobile sim sims. So uh, we have different types of uh, Sims uh, for uh, Android and uh, for uh, family OS systems. So uh, different people may choose different Sims uh, in their uh, mobile phones. Uh, and also, uh, there are more and more uh, abandoned applications such as e-commerce, uh, such as advertising uh, systems. Uh, there are some uh, common uh, requirements for the multiple recommendation. So the first question is, what can multiple models help for recommendation? Uh, the first uh, one is accuracy, because uh, most of the work uh, performed uh, for recommendation is improved uh, the accuracy of a recommender system. However, we can uh, divide the 
improvements from several different aspects. The first thing is how to uh, improve the code style problem uh, when a new video or a new news uh, emerges. Uh, and also, we can enhance the diversity of the recommendation. Uh, the multi mode understanding techniques also can be help uh, some domain generation, uh, such as uh, the data transfer from music recommendation to video recommendation. And uh, uh, in some tasks, we can help uh, build the explain ability uh, of the recommendation system. And uh, all these uh, techniques uh, can contribute the final user experience. So uh, it can improve the user engagement uh, for, for our system. And the second the problem is why is multi-mode pre-training metric? So uh, in tradition, uh, the research is more focused on uh, how to learn a good recommender given the pre-trained recommendations. And this task has been intensively uh, studied over the uh, last 20 years or so. Uh, however, these types of studies assume the recognitions are given. However, in production, the problem is more about how to learn a good recommendation given a recommendation task. So if we uh, enhance the recommendation models with the more modules uh, processing the pre-trained pre recommendations, the model will become slower and slower because it is uh, complex. However, the pre-training is performed offline. If we can get a Good recommendation, we can improve the recommendation model directly. So, uh, multi model pre training become more important uh, in production task. Here, I build an overall framework uh, for the multi model pre training for uh, recommendation. The first part is the general domain pre training. However, this domain uh, is more about multimodal understanding, such as um, classification, tagging, uh, object detection, and so on. So, uh, um, researchers from the survey domain or the multimodal domain uh, work, work on this problem. Uh, for recommendation system error, uh, we care more about the continued per training of the general domain multimodal. Uh, multiple models. So uh, here uh, we have different uh, domain data. First, uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, domain specific content, content data, such as the text, image, video, category, and text. And uh, they are not uh, present in uh, general domain prediction models. So the first task is how to leverage these types of raw data to contribute to the pre-training of uh, uh, multiple models. And the second type of uh, data is the behavior data. So people working in uh, multiple domain or survey domain, they don't care about how to leverage the behavior data. So this is a new opportunity to build a continuous pre-training of on the uh, recommender systems pre-training. And the continuous pre-training uh, is different from the general pre-training. It uh, is aimed to uh, incorporate this uh, dom domain specific data to improve quality of the model models. And also, uh, given the pre-training model, we have built some relative uh, function task. So we categorize uh, these studies into six types of uh, uh, studies. So the first survey is about how the continuous pre-training can be performed. So the first one is uh, how can we use self-supervised task to, uh, uh, to continue the training in a 
vertical domain. And the second is how to leverage some weak, weakly supervised signals such as uh, noisy graph uh, tags, uh, some topic uh, alterations. So, uh, also, uh, these types of uh, labels are in small scale. However, it can greatly help with the pre training task. And the third type is more about the recommendation. That is how to leverage the supervised single such as click uh, purchase to uh, continue the pre-training of multi-mode models. The, the second type of uh, work is about the downstream adaptation. So there are three types of work. The first one is how to give a pre-trained um, uh, model, how can we uh, transform the representations, especially in the multi-mode item representations? The second one is uh, given a pre-trained model, how can we uh, supervise fine-tuning the model in a downstream task? The last one is if we have already uh, trained model in our virtual domain, so how can we uh, especially fine-tuning uh, in a special uh, task. So uh, here we uh, categorize the self-supervised self learning task into three types. The first is uh, reconstructed. So uh, some tasks are about mask token prediction, uh, mask attribute prediction, and mask item prediction. These types of tasks uh, uh, have be, become uh, popular in the literature. Or, uh, we have uh, found a work, PRAC, which is collaborated um, uh, with Zhejiang University. And uh, we uh, have introduced the uh, mask token prediction and mask uh, attribute, attribute prediction into the use representation learning. And uh, also for the competitive learning paradigm, uh, some work such as MMS REC, uh, RECOBERG, you can uh, use uh, the competitive learning to align different modalities. And also given the single modality, you can align different parts such as title and the body. So, uh, the, the goal of the self supervised learning is to leverage the unlabeled domain data to help with the, the improvement of the prediction model. However, for the generative task, uh, I found that this domain is real uh, an empty error. So, there are some promising uh, future directions in this topic. So the first uh, work uh, in this framework is uh, about the is about the mask atom prediction and the mask the uh, category prediction, and uh, we perform this work in twenty twenty two. So here we mask different parts of the input of uh, news, and then we reconstruct it. Uh, using different uh, reconstruction laws. And finally, we can build uh, an uh, item representation uh, using uh, news content, especially in the uh, uh, title, uh, attribute, and the topics, uh, and the entities. The, and then we can use these build representations uh, as uh, cached embeddings uh, when importing them into recommendation models. And given this framework, uh, there are some other alternative works. Um, the record, uh, they also uh, use the mask the language modeling and the alignment between title and description to enhance the news recommendation problem. And in, uh, in addition, you know, uh, to the text domain, there are some uh, multi-domain tasks. Uh, for the multi-domain, we have input in the image, 
in the text. So uh, contrastive learning can be used here uh, to build the uh, contrastive task within modality and uh, course modalities. Uh, these two works uh, uh, have been tested in uh, ranking problems. So here, uh, this work is from Alibaba. Uh, they have uh, deployed these te techniques in production and uh, how we evaluate the effectiveness in their systems. The second type of uh, continual pre-training is how to use the weekly supervised singulars. And uh, weekly supervised singulars include uh, some uh, category. Uh, each video will have a category and the uh, facts and topics of news and something like that. And we also can collect the colorated uh, atom pairs and the knowledge graphs is quite common in production uh, systems. So how to leverage these labels with weekly supervised singulars to pre-train the model? There are some more so reference to work. The first one is a line rack. Uh, here it uses the uh, content category alignment to uh, reshape the representation space. So in this space, uh, articles in the same category will be similar. And uh, if two articles in different, have different category, they will be uh, distant. Uh, so uh, this is a way to directly align the con content and the category. And the second, work is about how to build a news embedding. And uh, it has been um, published in KDD in 2021. And uh, there are two uh, main um, pre-training tasks. The first one is also constructive learning. However, the second one is about topic classification. We can say uh, in their uh, model, there are two supervised singulars. Uh, the first one is the influence loss for constructive learning, and also there is another one for topic classification, and they use the multi-label classification loss here, that is BCE loss, uh, and they have evaluated the performance uh, after adding the BCE loss, uh, there are some additional improvements. And the third work is about how to leverage the knowledge graph uh, with weekly supervised singular. Here, the link prediction modeling aims to align the knowledge graph to uh, entities. So in multimodal domain, uh, each image has different attributes. So especially the color or some uh, different brand. So uh, if we can recognize the image into different entities uh, or attributes, we can build abundance of uh, triplets in the knowledge graph. However, given the present, uh, given these knowledge graph entities, how we leverage this data to help with pre-training? Here, uh, there are special design uh, to perform the multimodal representation learning. There are three tasks here, mask object modeling and mask language modeling. These two tasks are common in other papers. However, they have a third module, link prediction modeling. So if we can build a representation vector that can help with the link prediction, the representation will be better. So uh, there are pre-training laws is a summation of three individual ones here. However, uh, the aforementioned the three papers are working on multimode understanding. Uh, they are not tested in the recommendation problems. Uh, however, in production, we also leverage such kind of techniques uh, to help with the multimode understanding, and uh, we can get better uh, text and better recommendation vectors, and we can use them as features for recommendation tasks, especially for uh, uh, for matching. Uh, we can matching uh, different items in different uh, 
categories uh, or different tags, this can be used to filter the recommendation list. And the last type of uh, continuous pre-training framework is how to use the supervised singles. Given uh, the users and items, each user may have uh, interact with different items. However, uh, given uh, the, the relationship between user and item, we can get the user to item match, matching task. And given the item and item relationships, we can use item to item matching task here. And uh, we also uh, categorize the supervision uh, into the ID to modality alignment and the user to item course encoder. So there are four types of frameworks in uh, supervised pre-training. The first work uh, in user to item matching is the MS, MMS rack. So here uh, it uses the alignment between the user sequence and the target item. And this is a very uh, a simple idea. However, they share the sequence encoder and the item encoder. So this type of uh, models uh, have become quite popular recently. Uh, yeah. And uh, they have evaluated the contribute, contribution of different techniques. And uh, we can say without retraining, the performance will be uh, uh, worse than the standard models. And without text and uh, image modalities, the performance will become much worse than the uh, final model. So this have also evaluated the performance of multi-model pre-training. So following this work, uh, we have two uh, new uh, papers. The first one is, uh, uh, is our work. We collaborated with Tsinghua University and uh, in, in addition to the previous work, we have two uh, contrastive learning tasks. The first one is uh, sequence item contrastive learning, that is user to item matching. And the second one is the multi interest matching, that can ma match the subsequence of uh, a single user. So, following these two types of pre training tasks, we build a, a personalized uh, multimodal pre-training that can deliver different user representations using multimodal features. And uh, the following app work is from Tencent, uh, uh, the UDM2REC. Uh, it also uses the uh, sequence atom matching between users and atoms. And uh, in addition to single domain pre-training, it uh, proposes the multi-domain that can use domain A, domain 2, uh, domain B and domain C data together to uh, help with the pre-training. So uh, they also consider the multi-domain matching uh, across domain. So the sequence to sequence contrastive learning uh, is cross domain B and domain C. And this paper uh, is open uh, recently. Yeah. And the second type of uh, continuous pre-training with supervised single is item to item matching. Also, user to item matching is quite uh, straightforward. However, the training effort is very huge because uh, the user to item training logs are very huge in production. However, if we can uh, transfer it to item to item pre-training, uh, the training data will become much smaller. Since we can group the same item to item relation together. So here uh, we show two papers working on item to item alignment. The first one is from Xiao Hongshu. Uh, they use a CB2CF framework like this way. Uh, they first use the BERT encoder for text and the inception V3 for the image, and they uh, fuse the two modalities using the MLP. And then the, the uh, 
the key thing here is how to use a build the singles. Uh, in their paper, they show that they use the uh, item to item uh, recommendation uh, channel to get the uh, training logs from production. Uh, if uh, when user have uh, interacted uh, with the inter uh, item one, if we uh, recommend item two and the user has clicked, then this is a, a positive sample. And if we uh, recommend this item, but the user didn't click, uh, we mark it as a uh, negative sample. In this way, uh, we build an item to item alignment. And we have also evaluated this framework in our news recommendation and gained very uh, good uh, online metric game uh, improvement. And uh, the second is the item search from PE trains. And here we can say it can uh, aggregate the image uh, embeddings and the title embeddings with a transformer encoder. And then uh, differently, they use multiple tags and multiple types of sing uh, singles to train uh, uh, the atom encoder, including uh, search logs, uh, recommendation logs. Uh, so they have about uh, three uh, tasks uh, to, uh, to perform this uh, problem with a multi-task learning and then uh, shared atom embedding. And uh, these embeddings can be cast uh, in both matching and ranking phase. And uh, another framework is an uh, ID to modality alignment. Uh, in this framework, uh, <clears throat> we can build two uh, tower structure. The first one is the feature encoder. Uh, we can use multi-mode features as input. And the other one is the collaborative filtering encoder. We use the ID features and we can align the num together with the contrastive learning. And this paper has shown this framework in the code star scenario. And another work is in the music recommendation domain. They directly learn a collaborative filtering model as the labels. So they use a, a 40 dimensional vector as a single uh, super, supervised single and to uh, help with the pre training of a single encoder of the music audio. And then we can use the pre trained uh, modality encoder to help with the item to item recommendation. They have also evaluated uh, the framework in Spotify music recommendation. Uh, system. Okay, uh, here is a summarization of different types of continued pre-training uh, paradigms, and uh, uh, we classify it into three types: uh, sub-supervised, weekly supervised, and supervised. Uh, we want to assess assess their quality and the cost uh, from. Uh, uh, from an uh, industry perspective. And we think the most good uh, representation quality comes from the supervised framework because we can directly uh, train the modality encoder uh, using click logs or engagement logs. However, the training cost is um, very huge for this type of training because uh, in industry systems, we have a huge engagement uh, logs, about uh, several billions every day. This is uh, uh, much more huge than the uh, training data uh, in NLP and CV. So uh, these types of pre-training uh, is quite costly. And then the other types of representation, uh, especially self-supervised uh, representation, we think uh, their representations are more robust because for the click logs and the patterns in the click logs, especially for different types of users are change, uh, uh, rapidly changing every time. So uh, if we only pre-train the uh, uh, 
representation using self-supervised tasks such as mask token prediction or uh, item uh, or, or title body alignment. Such types of supervision uh, is more robust compared to the dynamic, dynamic uh, behaviors. So uh, in this way, if we can pre-train using self-supervised uh, tasks, we can catch uh, the representation for longer time. And uh, for example, we can pre-train these types of pre-training uh, every month. Uh, we need to pre-training this type of representations every day to capture a good representation. <clears throat> okay, this is the second part about uh, multimodal pre-training. So after we obtain the uh, pre-trained models, we wonder how can we uh, help with the recommendation. Uh, here I need the four types of uh, applications. The first one is how to help with the user item tagging. Uh, here, uh, this is, is the M5 product for e-commerce from Alibaba. And uh, they have used the pre-training task uh, to help with item tagging, especially for e-commerce. They can recognize different attributes from the image, from the title, and from the comments of the, uh, from the item. The second is how to use the multi-mode data to help with the sequential recommendation. There are also some recommendative work. And the third, third is the help with the ranking. And uh, recently, uh, especially in this uh, worldwide uh, and the web conference and this year, the Jindong have published the work of PPM and Chris uh, also have opened a new work, uh, especially on CTR prediction. They uh, studied how to leverage the you know, prediction models, the prediction multimodal models uh, in CTR prediction. And uh, the last one is how to help with the uh, re-ranking. Especially if we use multiple features, we can enhance the diversity of the recommendation list. So we also want to classify uh, these techniques into different uh, frameworks. The first one is the representation transfer. Uh, in this frame, in this uh, framework, uh, the multiple features are usually phrased as embedding features. Uh, they don't. Uh, Continuing or adapt and uh, embedding anymore. However, they study how to incorporate these embedding features into downstream tasks. And the other types is about joint fine tuning about the uh, modality encoders and the downstream task. The third one uh, is uh, how to uh, adapt the multi mode uh, large model, especially LLM to help with, the uh, help with the recommendation task. There are also some uh, uh, adapters focusing on how to fuse the multiple features. Okay, uh, for the recommendation transfer, there are uh, different uh, characteristics. Uh, the first one is uh, how to use the multiple features as set information. Uh, in this work, MMGCM, uh, they take the um, different modality uh, with different um, features and they uh, build uh, three graphs uh, in the text domain, in the image domain, and in the audio domain. And then they perform the GCN operation in different modalities and finally incorporate their ratings. Uh, and then the other work uh, actually take a lot of perspective. They use contrastive learning uh, uh, to uh, to uh, align the content modality and the, the ID modality. They also alignment different modalities together. Uh, so uh, in this way, the features are taken as an uh, X in a sample. And then in this way, uh, they also use the modality as a Y part as a weekly supervised singular to help with the pre-training to help with the downstream task. <clears throat> and the second type is uh, the user representation learning from multimodal sequence. So uh, 
in this type of framework, uh, they don't focus only on atom representation. They focus on how to uh, fill the multimodal sequence. Given a sequence in, for example, here in image sequence, we want to uh, represent this user into a representation vector. So here uh, they build an MOE adapter uh, especially for this task. And they have two types of uh, adapters. The first one is shared across different modalities. And the second one is the uh, modality specific MOE. And in this way, they can model the uh, common and the specific parts of uh, um, different modalities. However, the goal is still modeling a better user representation vector. And in the second work, the am right here, uh, we performed the work uh, about three years ago. Uh, in this work, we aggregate, we want to aggregate the multimodal features from uh, a user viewpoint. And from the view, uh, from the user view, uh, actually we don't, we not only can see the image, and also when we see the image, we 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 are reading the text. So here we want to aggregate different types of uh, modalities uh, together. And here we build a, a local to global the, to global uh, aggregation workflow. And first we aggregate the interaction between uh, image tokens to uh, word tokens. And then we aggregate the representation vector of the image and the text together. The third type of work is about how to denoise the multimodal sequence and how to aggregate the, the sequence uh, in ranking stage. And uh, these three papers are all about CTR prediction. And then the first work is, uh, is about um, multi-mode attention network. Uh, it is similar um, to the DLN work. However, uh, they uh, argue a new perspective. We need to uh, denoise the multi-mode feature embeddings because some embedding themes may more about the semantic and some themes may uh, only noise for the recommendation mm -hmm. task. So here they use uh, adversary learning task here to distill the common and the uh, modality specific features. And finally, they, they aggregate the features, uh, useful features into the uh, CTR model. And there are some other two works uh, are very similar. And this is from Jindong, and this is from uh, Alibaba. Mm. And they work, work on how to uh, uh, distangle the multimodal features into common uh, features into the modality specific features. And they also use the what's a single single to this to the multimodal features into useful features and noise. And this uh, types of works uh, have focused on CTR prediction. So they uh, have made some improvements over the DIN work. Okay, in the last uh, category of the uh, 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 type uh, is about the uh, joint fine tuning. Uh, the, the first one is how to fine tune uh, mod modality encoder in downstream task. Uh, in the, these two work uh, only focus on fine tuning atom set encoder, especially in CTR prediction, we have user encoder, encoder and atom encoder. And to reduce the uh, fine tuning overhead, uh, these two works only uh, fine tuning the atom uh, set uh, multiple uh, encoders. So here uh, they can add the same network here uh, as a set feature encoder. After joint fine tuning, they can cache their embeddings as supplementary features directly. And then when serving online, and the encoders can be dropped. This is a good um, point of uh, joint fine tuning uh, because 
uh, in this serving paradigm, uh, the, <clears throat> the embeddings can be uh, still uh, pre-computed. And then they can use the cache embeddings when serving. <clears throat> Okay, uh, the, the other type of work focusing on fine tuning both atom side and the user side encoders. And uh, this work is from Microsoft. Uh, they provide a work for news recommendation. And uh, we can say uh, both in the user side sequence and uh, the atom side have multi mode uh, encoders. They encode the multi mode features and uh, aggregate it to perform the uh, user atom matching. And uh, there are some similar work uh, focusing on fine tuning both atom side and user side. And the last uh, one is about fine tuning user atom force encoder. And this work is published in the uh, uh, web conference this year uh, from Jindong. And uh, they uh, first build the atom encoder to uh, to, to cache the atom embeddings. And then they pre-train a behavior transformer and then fine tune the transformer in the CTR prediction problem. And they uh, perform the task using a two-stage framework. And uh, both the multi-mode atom embeddings can be cached and the, 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 atom, uh, the user behavior transformer can be fine tuned. So, uh, they will follow the joint fine tuning framework. And uh, with the scaling sk or multi-mode models, uh, joint fine tuning become harder and harder, especially mm -hmm. for multi-mode large language models, okay? So um, more recent work focusing on how to adapt the multi-mode models in a parameter efficient way, especially how to use the adapt, especially NORA, and uh, Qforma and something like that to uh, align the you know, recommendation task and the multi-mode oh, task. Nice. And this paper is published uh, in last month. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, they joined the twin, the multi-mode model and the ranking model. However, different from joint training, they freeze the basic uh, parameter of the of the vision encoder and the text encoder, only uh, fine tuning the uh, uh, QFORMA and then the NORA. So they can be performed in a much more parameter efficient way to align the uh, uh, modality encoder to the downstream task. And in addition to the uh, CTR prediction problem, they also use additional nodes to align the ID modality to the uh, Mm, content, content modality uh, to help with the pre-training, uh, to help with the training. So uh, after, after the uh, uh, training, this uh, atom embeddings can also be cached. So uh, this type of work uh, is also very practical in production. Uh, the last one is about how to uh, adapt uh, large language model for recommendation. And this work is a VIP file. Uh, they focus on how, focus on, uh, how to adapt a PU uh, language model. And uh, as we know, if we use PU, we can conduct different recommendation tasks uh, using the language as an interface. However, if we want to uh, um, input the multi-model features, we can't do that. So follow the belief uh, framework, they also consider the image sequence as the input. Uh, then they can build an uh, adapter in uh, uh, so Then they build some uh, alignment task to align different, uh, to align the input to the output. And they, after the training, they can perform the downstream task uh, was similar as PU. However, they can use the interleaved uh, sequence of images and tags as input. So uh, this framework uh, also is very uh, in a very early stage. However, we can say uh, 
uh, in future, we may have the opportunity to build a large model to take the interleaved sequence as input and output the recommendation result. And uh, also in this framework, we can uh, build the conversational uh, recommendation ability, uh, especially uh, not only we can make recommendations, this model can also make uh, conversations with the users. And then we summarize some characteristics of the uh, downstream adaptation frameworks. There are three types of uh, uh, downstream adaptation uh, frameworks. The representation, representation transfer uh, aims to um, use the representation vectors as features directly. However, the joint fine tuning and the adapter tuning uh, aims to align the representation uh, from the encoder better uh, by using the uh, downstream uh, click singles. And from the quality, we know if we fine tune the modality encoders, we can, we can get better alignment quality, especially for joint fine tuning. However, the cost uh, is very high. So in production problems, we prefer the uh, uh, recognition transfer and adapt tuning, which, uh, uh, which become much more efficient. And finally, I'd like to introduce some uh, promising future directions. And we are actively working on these problems and, and uh, in, especially uh, in the multiple pre-training, uh, the, the community mm. is still uh, have some ongoing problems and uh, the, pro the papers uh, are not mm, so many. So there are some uh, research opportunities for uh, the junior researchers and the students. The first one, is how to build a vertical domain uh, multimodal foundation model. So uh, well, why here I read uh, foundation model because uh, it is different from a large language model. Uh, it is more about the uh, build a generative model using vertical domain data only. So uh, as, we, as, as we said, uh, the data in the production system are huge, especially we have multi-domain data. Uh, especially we can collect data from music recommendation system and the video recommendation system and the news recommendation system. If we want to uh, collaborate such types of data, we can um, be, we can also build a large model. However, uh, this is different from the uh, world knowledge. It is about vertical domain knowledge. I think. Uh, if we can build a such type of model, we can transfer it to other uh, companies, to other uh, open domain problems, okay? So uh, there are some types of uh, characteristics here. Uh, we want to use uh, one model for multiple tasks. So uh, foundation models uh, can perform different tasks using a single model, especially uh, like a unified I.O. And here we was also want to unify the modeling of different modalities here. And the second uh, pathway is about how to uh, incorporate uh, the pre-training the multiple large language models to help with the uh, recommendation. And this type of work is about how to adapt the large language models uh, or how to transfer the knowledge to recommendation, okay? So uh, in a different way is uh, existing work care more about representation learning. However, for large language models, they care more about generative modeling uh, ability. So uh, how can we uh, transfer the representation framework to a generative framework for recommendation is still an open problem. And the third uh, question is whether we can verify the model scaling law in uh, recommendation problem. Uh, a talk from Meta uh, in the morning have uh, 
have talked about uh, work about GR uh, have evaluated the security node. However, uh, how could how can we uh, build uh, such types of work in a multi-domain task is an open problem here. Uh, especially if we're working on uh, multi-mode, natural language models uh, and uh, efficiency will become a very large bottleneck, especially for uh, real-time recommendation tasks. And third, uh, we want to uh, provide some benchmarks and evaluation uh, tools uh, like uh, um, bus. But we built the bus previously, especially on uh, CTR problems and uh, matching problems. However, uh, it is still open in a multimodal recommendation domain. Here, uh, there are some uh, uh, published uh, multimodal data sets uh, recently. And the last thing is uh, we, we, we are hiring and uh, we also want to uh, incorporate some multimodal large language model techniques and uh, uh, and also incorporate some pre-training tags into our production system. So uh, our jobs uh, transfer the uh, uh, transferring the uh, uh, pre-trained uh, multimodal models uh, to the uh, applications. If you are interested in uh, how to apply such types of techniques in production, uh, we can discuss later. And uh, uh, especially, we have some open uh, positions for the research interns. And if you are interested in our uh, work, uh, you can send your CV to us. Uh, thank you. So, if you have any questions, I'm very glad to make a discussion. Okay, if you don't have uh, specific questions, we can discuss offline. And uh, here we have a coffee break time and uh, uh, we can return uh, about uh, 3.30 and uh, we have 15 minutes uh, coffee break. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, so uh, let's resume the this session. Uh, I'm Rei Zhang, and uh, I will uh, continue with what Jaming has talked about, about multimodal pre-training for recommendations. I will talk about the multimodal generation for recommendation. Uh, there has been a, a significant progress, progress in multimodal generation. Uh, as we know, uh, in text to image, we have mid journey and uh, stable diffusion, and uh, in text to vi uh, video, we have Sora. Right, so um, we have been very impressed by their progress in the past year or two. Um, however, uh, for for these models, uh, they will generate exactly the same thing for every person. Right, so um, it doesn't relate to anyone. Uh, if you have certain preferences, um, it won't care, right? So uh, we, we would wonder whether we can personalize the content to be generated so that it is relevant to each individual and be more engaging. So uh, that's the question we are asking in, in this talk. Um, so can we make them personal? Right, so that uh, we can make not just multimodal generation, but personalized multimodal generation. And that is what uh, this talk is about. Um, I hope, I wish we could remove this, uh, this bar here because I have content below that cannot be seen. Um, yeah, so uh, first we'll, we'll uh, Cover the personalized multimodal generation uh, for for recommendation, and um, uh, there are two main notable uh, papers I will talk about. And um, uh, because there are only a few papers 
on this topic uh, yet. So uh, we will move on to uh, you know very relevant, but also uh, personal generation, but it's not multimodal. So it was uh, usually single model to single model, uh, but they could inspire the future work for this multimodal generation uh, using some of the ideas. And uh, 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 later I will also talk about some other tasks for uh, multimodal generation for recommendation. Uh, because personalization is not uh, the only thing for recommendation, right? So we can make things more personalized, uh, which would be uh, better for recommendation. Uh, we could also uh, use large language model or use other methods to make the features more uh, attractive. And uh, uh, that could also help recommendation. But uh, in this talk, I, my focus would be more on the personalized uh, generation part. Uh, so I'll, I will mention a few other uh, studies, and in the end, we'll talk about what's, what is next. And uh, uh, in this context, as you can see, uh, large language model is, uh, plays a very important role uh, in this process. And especially, this is the current trend where uh, almost everyone is trying to use, it, uh, use LLM uh, to, to, in, uh, to, to do this. So uh, we would see more and more of that coming. So. Um, uh, I, I uh, intentionally uh, want to mention whether uh, LRM is used or not. And uh, here, when I talk about LRM, I uh, refer to the large language models with the capabilities similar to ChatGPT, such as uh, Llama, Cloud, Gemini, et cetera, which has almost uh, you know, a zero shot uh, generic language capabilities uh, rather than uh, uh, more traditional transformers, BERT type models. And uh, uh, if you uh, want to uh, look, check out the references and uh, the papers uh, about this talk. So there are a couple of publications we have. Uh, one is the, this tutorial itself, and the other one uh, is a survey paper we have put in uh, archive. All right. So um, we'll first cover uh, the personalized multimodal generation. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we now can do. Uh, multimodal generation, but we would like to make it more uh, relevant, more personalized to users, right? So uh, let's use an example to motivate this. Um, currently, there are already many messaging and social uh, applications uh, which will generate uh, em emoticons according to or based on what a user is typing, uh, such as uh, TikTok, uh, Discord, uh, WeChat, um, and, and uh, many other apps. So uh, what happens is if uh, two people are chatting here uh, as one person is typing, I'm happy, uh, rather than uh, this person has to search the, the emoticon for happy and then click it, uh, the app itself will automatically detect that this person is saying I'm happy. So it's going to automatically generate this candidate uh, emoticons such as smiley faces so that the user just need to click it so that it, it comes. Um, so this is a, a very useful uh, tool, and um, uh, but the uh, this is a non-personalized version, which means uh, doesn't matter who does this, uh, the the emoticon pops up is always the standard smiley face. So let's see how we may make it more uh, personalized and engaging. So let's say this uh, person is a cat lover, so she loves uh, cute cats, and uh, when she types "I'm happy." So the emoticons uh, pop up would be smiley cats. Uh, so if another person likes, let's say, Kung Fu Panda, so the uh, emoticons pop up would be smiley uh, Kung, Fu, Kung Fu Pandas. So this will be more engaging to, uh, to the users and uh, improve their user experience. Um, so uh, another uh, advantage is that, so for these uh, traditional standard ones, usually they will pop up uh, if, there's an existing uh, emoticon in the database, in the uh, current database, and they will actually pick one candidate. Um, uh, of course, some of the apps have uh, some kind of generation, but the generation is very naive. Uh, but in, uh, in this case, it actually uh, can generate uh, emoticons that doesn't exist in the uh, e existing image uh, databases. And um, uh, so, this is not just the only application. Uh, so now imagine if uh, this is an e-commerce website, right? So uh, when you are searching for clothes or searching for some products, 
uh, let's say if it's a lady, the clothes will automatically generate a image of, uh, of a, a female uh, who wear that clothes, or if it's a, a, a male, or if it's an office person, so it may generate very business style uh, clothes. Uh, or if it is a uh, news, and uh, you think about the news streams, and when we uh, look at, let's say, uh, um, uh, the, the Google News or Toutiao, uh, right? So uh, the news keeps coming. Um, sometimes the news titles don't change. They are the same for everyone. But it will be more, you, you may have uh, experienced that when it's uh, uh, generated according to your preference, usually it's much easier for you to uh, uh, be interested and click it. So that would also uh, improve the chance of you finding the most interesting contents. So there are actually many applications for this uh, personalized uh, recommendation. Um, so uh, the question is, let's see how we, we may do this, right? So um, the, uh, the, the idea is simple. We can already do text to image generation, right? So now we just need to understand the user's preference and then use this preference to control the generation to be it to make it relevant to this person's uh, preference. So uh, in this particular example would be this person is interested in cute cats from her past conversation. So we are going to convert this uh, past conversation or other behaviors into interest like uh, you know, cute cats. And these cute cats keywords will be used to control the uh, text to image generation uh, for, uh, by, for example, stable diffusion or mid journey. So uh, that is the process. And uh, let's see how we may, uh, we may do uh, this whole thing uh, specifically. So first, what we do is we will convert the user behaviors. It could be uh, conversations or clicks. So this person may have clicked uh, images of cats, right? Or other kinds of behavior into natural language. The reason we want to convert it into natural language because the keywords are currently are used to control the uh, text to image generation tools like stable diffusion. And uh, uh, how do we do this? So then a uh, large language model will come into play because uh, they are very good at understanding uh, complex behaviors or, or text and then uh, summarize them into a, a, a small number of keywords so that we can use them to control the generation. So the first step is to convert those behaviors into natural language. Um, if the behavior is uh, conversation is already text, then it's straightforwardly fed into a large language model. If it is some other behavior such as uh, image or clicks, so we may look at the content and try to convert that content into uh, natural language first. Uh, if it's an image, we can use an image to text tool uh, to, to convert it, such as uh, Bleep2 or other uh, kinds of models. Okay, so after we convert the behaviors into natural language, uh, we will extract user preference from the natural language. So uh, in this case, uh, it will be uh, maybe the user has talked about she likes the cute cats. We will extract keywords such as cute cats. Uh, and this can be a few uh, keywords. And later we'll show that we may add also other soft embeddings to better represent this kind of preference. After we understand and learn the preference of the user, we'll use the preference to condition the multimodal generation. That is, you know, we will use, for example, cute cats to, con to control the stable diffusion uh, uh, generation and then we get our uh, desired result. And uh, as a result, we, uh, we have done experiments on quite a few uh, data sets, and uh, we find that it has improved by 8% in terms of the personalization uh, measure. And uh, this is a, uh, a work we have published and, uh, in this conference, and I uh, would encourage you to take a look at it uh, on this Friday uh, afternoon session. Okay, so uh, let's take a closer look at uh, how we may do this uh, in, in a model. Um, so we have uh, two things we would like to take into account. First is the target item. That is the item we would like to generate when we do not consider user preference. So in that previous example is the smiley face. Right, so we, without personalization, we just generate a smiley face. And uh, uh, when we consider user uh, preference or behavior, uh, that would be that person says, I love cute cats. 
Uh, then we would also need to capture this preference. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, for, the for the target item, if it's an image, we'll convert the image to text. If it's a text already, we'll just use that text. And uh, both the preference, uh, the, the user behavior, which represent the preference, and the target item converted into keywords together will be fed into an uh, existing large language model. Uh, in our case, we have used Llama 2.7b. Uh, um, then they will be converted into a few keywords which represent the preference of the user. Okay, um, uh, also we have a, key, a few keywords that represent the target item. And then they will be both fed into a stable diffusion model. Okay, so this whole part uh, would be a stable diffusion. You could also use uh, other uh, text to, to image or to other kind of media generator. And uh, the text encoder and the gen generator are both uh, directly coming from that uh, text to image generator. Uh, they're frozen. Um, we do have some uh, in the middle here. Uh, one is the target item embeddings. Uh, after the text encoder, it becomes embeddings, right? And then the, key the preference keywords, they will convert into a hard preference, but we also add another, uh, this kind of, uh, we add another uh, uh, large language model, which is tunable uh, on the side so that we can capture uh, the preferences which are not captured by the keywords. So uh, by the current, uh, for example, stable diffusion or some other text tool, image models, they limit the number of keywords. Um, in some cases, only a couple of dozen of keywords can be used. So uh, the num those keywords may not be enough to represent fully or accurately the preference. Or uh, as we know, keywords are discrete representations, right? So they may not have the full representation capability. That's why we have this uh, um, uh, what we call a bias correction large language model to <clears throat> help adapt this representation, uh, which is a soft representation, a soft embedding together with the hard embedding. Uh, and then they are fed to the final generator to help generate this. So that's why we would generate the target, uh, like the car car target image, as well as what the user prefers. So uh, in this case, the user may prefer like, uh, you know, thriller, uh, disaster kind of movie. So uh, the Titanic itself is a, a love uh, story, right? So in the end, it, it is still like a love story, but with more uh, like a disastrous uh, style here in the, in the final poster. And uh, uh, we have a, a small module here, which is the waiting to control how much we want to balance the preference and the target item. So we'll show you uh, um, the effect in, in this uh, result. So here uh, from the left, from the left to the right, it shows how the weights between them change and the results are. So uh, WP is the weight for the preference and a WT is the weight for uh, the target item. So when the preference weight is very small, it will just generate a image of Titanic, which is like a, a love story poster. And then as the uh, weight of the preference gets higher and higher, uh, it, it takes more of the disastrous uh, preference. And uh, at the end, the, the love story part, you know, uh, aspect uh, disappear and it becomes totally a disastrous uh, poster. So um, that's how we, uh, the user can control this by this weighting. Okay, um, so we, all, we also look at how we may train this uh, whole thing, right? So uh, when we take the user behavior and also the target item, they are both fed into the uh, stable diffusion, uh, first uh, the, uh, the large language model and then the sta stable diffusion, we have the bias correction uh, correction large language model, which is tunable, right? So this would be something like uh, Blip2, where we have the multimodal tokens and uh, we use a uh, P-tuning to, to uh, uh, use as an adapter to tune us. And they will later be fed into some linear layer to get the soft embeddings. 
together with the hard preference embeddings, uh, they will generate using the uh, text to image generation uh, generator uh, will generate the ultimate image. And we will compare that ultimate image with the uh, ground truth. Uh, I will um, talk about the ground truth a bit later. So basically we have a series of uh, items the user has clicked on. So we will, let's say the first 10, uh, we will use it as the historical behavior and the 11th will be the ground truth image. Or we use the first 11th and the the twelve will be the ground truth uh, image. So this this is like the sequential recommendation uh, type of training, uh, and this part is the equation which shows how we uh, the standard way of uh, training the stable diffusion network. And this uh, this example shows how uh, in the e-commerce scenario uh, this personalization would help. For example, if it's shoes, uh, if the user's preference is business style is going to generate a man's business shoes and a man's business shirt. And if it's the style, uh, the preference of the user is girl's style is going to generate uh, ladies' uh, shoes and ladies' shirt, et cetera. Uh, and this, uh, um, as we can see, clearly would be more engaging for users. Um, so we have generated uh, three data sets to verify this. Uh, and uh, the first one we use the uh, data set called POG is a multimodal data set of fashion clothes. And uh, we, so is is a, um, a series of user clicks on the items. So we selected uh, a number of users and uh, items for the experiment as, as I mentioned. So we will use the first uh, N items in the sequence as training. And then the next one would be the ground truth. And we can do this for, you know, many times, right? Uh, we do the similar for the uh, movie lens data set. And we also use the emoticon data set to, to verify that. And uh, uh, if we, we measure the uh, similar similarity between the generated item to the target item as well as the preference item. So uh, we show uh, improvement on both. We also did a user evaluation where uh, our our work uh, proposed method PMG uh, outperforms the other methods or we outperform some with no personalization uh, by a large margin. <clears throat> okay, so that was uh, pers uh, personalized uh, multimodal generation for recommendation because you know when we show something, the user will either click or not click. So it's something recommended to, for the user, right? Um, so another task, uh, that has been done for personalized multimodal generation is uh, for sort of recommendation related queries or is more like an answer question and answer. Yeah, so it's quite blurry, unfortunately. Um, uh, so the, the first one is, is recommendation. Second one is a, a preference. So the recommendation is trying to predict what's the next item that the user will like. And then preference prediction is to predict the user's preference on a certain item. And then explanation generation is to uh, generate why, the reason why a user is, uh, likes a, or doesn't like a certain item. So uh, this work has uh, considered a number of these kind of tasks, and then they will be used as prompts to, to prompt the, the, the model. And, when the model see a certain prompt, it's going to generate uh, an answer co corresponding to that prompt. So uh, this is like how we train a large language model, right? So we may have many prompts and then uh, followed by the uh, responses for those prompts. And then we will just do a lot of pre-training. We will get the answer. Uh, so, um, so this one is different from the first one in that uh, the it, it doesn't have that aspect of um, learning each individual user's different uh, behavior. And then during the generation tries to uh, incorporate that, that generation. It more, uh, it's more like to pick some of the uh, items from the candidate data set. Um, but the, uh, this one is useful for e-commerce website because it can do many multimodal tasks. Okay, so uh, the way it achieves this 
is uh, for a multimodal item such as uh, an item, uh, this is a laptop. It has an image, it has title, it has category descriptions, etc. So what they do is first they will just flatten uh, all this information into like uh, different attributes of an item. And then uh, at the same time, they will use a vision encoder to in encode the, the image. And together they will be fed into uh, a network or into a, a large model. And uh, they, uh, as I mentioned, they will use the prompt tuning uh, to learn by what under different prompt they should answer differently. Uh, and that's how they, they do it. Okay, so it's by prompt tuning and also for multimodal, they will just fuse the different multi uh, the multimodal modalities. Okay, so uh, those are the two um, uh, recent personalized multimodal generation. Uh, so the next uh, sequence of uh, papers is they are not multimodal, but they are um, personalized generation. And uh, uh, there are ideas I think they could be used potentially. Um, the, and a lot of the work in this category uh, relates to the task of a news he uh, headline generation. So what it does is um, made uh, it for a certain news in order they want to want users to click on it, right? Uh, so they will generate different titles for different users. Uh, if you like um, uh, a certain thing, they will maybe embed that item uh, into the news head. So here is an example. Uh, it is an NBA game where the LA Clippers lose to the LA uh, uh, Lake, Lakers on, on a certain day. And uh, one person is the fan of uh, players in one team and the other person is a fan of another team. And they would be interested in totally different people uh, in this same event. So uh, let's say this person is the fan of uh, this player called Kawhi Lala. And this person uh, is the fan of uh, the player LeBron James. So if we create news titles, uh, you know, separately for these two people using the pe players they are interested in, then it's more likely they will click on it, right? So that's um, the basic idea of uh, news he headline generation. And actually, um, I, you, you as a reader may not realize this. I don't know how many of you have actually uh, uh, experiences or felt about this. Like, can you raise your hand? When you see a news, you feel like that news actually the headline or the image uh, is um, is generated for your preference. Has, has anyone experienced this or realized? Uh, I actually I I do realize this because uh, when I uh, I I read news from China and also news from overseas website. So when I go to see uh, the news from overseas, uh, I find that they will, uh, when I read some the news, they will uh, particularly pick new, uh, use the headlines include China in their headlines too. <laughs> and also put a uh, image like a Chinese uh, national flag in the image to attract my attention. And uh, uh, maybe you do, do not realize, but uh, you're already user, heavy users of such um, uh, generated news items. So, um, okay, so that's the background. And there, there's uh, actually a lot of work on this. So let's see how this is really done. Uh, this is the framework of how, how it is done. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel so sorry that it is so blurry, but basically the, Left hand side is the candidate news uh, item, and the right hand side is what this user has clicked in the past. So from this user's past behavior, we can learn its preference. And then when we generate a news item, we will use this preference to condition the generation of that news item. So that's the basic idea. This is similar to what I have uh, shown in the first work, where when we want to generate a smiley face, we will use the user's preference cute cat to condition it so that it becomes you a smiley cat face, right? So it's very similar. And uh, uh, actually there's a, another paper which has simplified this image where, um, so the, the user has a click history 
it will encode this user's behavior and um, the, the candidate news will be input here. They will just use this user's behavior to uh, condition the generation. Um, uh, but do note that this generation is using the pointer network uh, is a pointer generator. This is a sort of the um, uh, tradition of the, the last uh, generation method uh, of, of techniques. Um, and uh, they will generate the headline. Uh, so they have not uh, used the large language model like chat GPT or uh, uh, Llama. Um, but that's the idea. And the, how do we evaluate uh, whether a generated news uh, headline is good or not? So there are two ways to evaluate. Of course, you can always do human evaluation, but let, how, how do we do automatic evaluation? Uh, first is to evaluate the inform, uh, informativeness. Um, people have used the F1 uh, rogue to evaluate that. So um, it, uh, it basically measures how uh, the two, uh, the bigram and the uh, trigram of, of the message. And the other one is the fluency. So it will try to measure the, the real news title, um, which means when it doesn't have personalization, uh, compare with, with personalization and see uh, how long is the longest common uh, subsequence. Okay, so that one is for news generation. Uh, in e-commerce, we can also do something similar. Uh, so this is a product, right? So it's a, uh, it's a camera lens. And when someone asks, when a user asks something about this camera uh, to decide whether to buy, uh, the personalized answer would, would uh, try to use the user's preference. Maybe, for example, this user in the past has always preferred cheap products. So the description would say it, it pays a little less than uh, uh, less than uh, some some other lens, and this uh, user in the past maybe uh, it has uh, uh, a great interest in this D five thousand one hundred. Uh, I don't know some kind of uh, camera. It will say it, it will work beautifully with this camera, and uh, uh, and this third user maybe ca cares about the lightweight. So it will say it has lightweight glass. Uh, as you can see, again, it tries to use the user's preference to condition the answer when a uh, user asks questions. Uh, I haven't personally experienced the, the, you know, when I buy something online, I haven't personally experienced this yet, but I, I think this would be a very useful feature if they do have this. And the uh, structure, uh, if we simplify it, it will be actually very similar to the previous one. So I would not uh, uh, repeat this. Um, uh, yeah, and again, uh, this one uses uh, transformer. It doesn't use the large language model yet. Okay, so uh, the next work is to actually use large language model. Uh, this is a more recent work. Uh, it can, can considers more text-to-text -text, uh, tasks. So rather than a single like a news head generation, uh, it considers two categories. One is text classification. The other one is text generation. In the classification, it considers citation, identification, movie tagging, product rating, et cetera. And for personalized text generation, it considers news head, uh, headline generation, et cetera. So you, you can see all this. And uh, uh, so it uses one, trains one model to do all these tasks. And uh, another important thing is it uses the uh, retrieval augmented generation. Um, I think this is a, a very uh, uh, important and uh, the right way to go. Um, in the past, when we generate something, you should we should base the generation on something, right? So when I generate a smiley cat, I want to generate my smiley cat based on a smiley face, but with the condition of cat, right? So here, uh, this is what it does. It has the user profile, which is like our preference. It will condition the content being retrieved, but you know, using RAG, you will retrieve some content and then based on the content, you generate some candidate, candidate answer, right? And then from the candidate answers, you will fuse them together to generate the final answer. That's where uh, it will use this uh, uh, input, input would be the, the question uh, or, or a user uh, want a certain item, the target item in our case, and, and then use a user profile to, to condition to first generate the candidates, 
And then together with the input, it will uh, uh, go through the large language model to generate the out final output. Uh, so that one is with large language model. And uh, this one go uh, further step is still text to text, but it will use not only language, large language model, but also human inter intervention. So uh, it's still generating news headline. Uh, by looking at the article, one way is to let the model automatically generate it, right? So here it develops a tool where a user can, uh, uh, so a large language model will generate the candidate keywords. So these are candidate keywords from this article. I know it's too small to, to see, um, uh, but the article is about UN Security Council and these are keywords like UN Security, uh, um, uh, Human, uh, yeah, uh, arms sales, etc. So some candidate keywords generated by the large language model, and uh, it will allow users to click on some of them so that it will learn the user's preference online and then generate a news uh, headline. Um, and this this one, this third approach, it will even uh, generate a certain headline, uh, let the user pick some of them, and then it will revise. So uh, there, this kind of interactive way. Um, I don't, I don't think it uh, suits this application though, because you basically the is impossible for the news agency to allow you to interactively to change to do this, right? But this, I think, it is useful for uh, co-creation, as mentioned here. So if I want to write an article, or if I want to design a poster, or if I want to draw. A, a piece of art, right? So I can in, interact with the model and uh, then make it uh, generate things that I, I like more. Okay, uh, and this final one, uh, it is uh, multi-model generation uh, from multi-model to multi-model, but this one is not personalized. So it's still news headline generation, uh, it's not personalized. Um, I think it can be uh, used uh, easily used for personalization. So it provides a way to fuse different uh, models, modalities. Uh, it's actually quite simple. You just append the uh, other modalities to the text model. So like image or videos, it will just append it there, put them together. This is the same way as the second work I, I uh, uh, presented. And they will all be put into a transformer and uh, uh, become an embedding where the first uh, uh, majority of the embedding are about the text. And then the final few are about the indexes of the multimodal content, such as image or the videos. Okay. Um, all right, so I have covered about um, the personalized multimodal generation and the personalized generation, and some of the non-personalized multimodal generation. And then let's see, uh, there are a few other tasks that may be used for uh, recommendation and it's also kind of multimodal generation. The first one is to uh, generate a, uh, a copy of advertisement. So it's called a marketing copy generation. If I have a product like this one, this one is like, a, uh, uh, I think it's like a financial product, okay? And uh, what kind of image I should put here? What kind of words saying like uh, annual uh, yield up to 8%? And this one say uh, claim time should be uh, uh, limited, et cetera. So what words I should generate? What image should I generate? So these are all uh, different choices. Um, and uh, if you choose differently, the users may click it on it uh, uh, more likely or less likely. So uh, this work has used, uh, it's not a large language model, use the um, uh, reinforced learning to try different uh, options in order to optimize this. Uh, a second one is uh, explanation generation. So what it does is it will generate reasons for someone, uh, for something to be recommended to a user. So uh, that will help the user understand, uh, okay, this is relevant to me, so I want to buy. Actually, some of the products, I think uh, in your uh, app, like uh, I think JD and uh, maybe even Taobao. So when they show some uh, the, the products, they have some tags. Those tags are 
lots of the tags are personalized. So different users, when you look at the tags, they, they are different. So you will react to the tags that are more relevant to you. So uh, this is the same. Uh, I will provide the reason why I recommend a certain song or a certain product to you. So you, you will find it more uh, engaging. And the uh, third one is uh, dialogue generation. Um, uh, and this is not just any dialogue generation, it's more of uh, generating uh, description or questions for guiding users during a conversational either search or conversational recommendation. So when the user is interacting with the system, the system try to generate the conversation that is very relevant to that user. Okay, so uh, so that's the most of the existing work. Let's see what uh, may come next. Uh, the first thing, uh, the, the first work I, I, I presented, uh, I mentioned the personalized multimodal generation for recommendation, and we input the multimodal information and generate an image, right? And uh, it's natural to extend that to the output is also multimodal. So we not only input text, image, and other multimodalities into uh, the model and the output image, we also want to output image and text and other kinds of multi uh, modalities. So that's one. And second, we want to improve the control of the correctness. Uh, models like a sta a stable diffusion and uh, uh, mid-journey or uh, even Sora, uh, as we know, they still have logical mistakes in, or errors in their generation. So um, we have found that the, the stable diffusion we use is generate wrong text in the posters. So uh, how can we control the correctness? That's a, a issue especially when we generate multi-modal items. We don't want to sacrifice the, uh, the quality of the generated item similar to the target item, but at the same time, we want to enforce the correctness. And then um, we would like to include more modality, modalities, and not just text image, uh, and should also be audio, video, uh, I don't know, other kinds of modalities. And finally, we would like to have interactive multimodal generation. So it's not just one shot, we generate once and it, uh, that's it. We would like the user to interact with the, uh, with, with the system so that the user can control. Uh, recently, Google has, an, uh, work, has a work called Genie, uh, generative, um, uh, generative uh, controlled uh, environment or something. So that one, you can uh, use an image to, and then user will just press, uh, like playing the game, press up, down, left, right. And that will become a, like you will control the person uh, moving in that image it becomes like playing the game. And uh, which was very impressive. Okay, so uh, I think that's uh, all I would like to cover, and thanks. And uh, uh, also, I would put, put some ad here. Uh, if you want to join the company, right, uh, Huawei is here. And uh, if you want to join academia, I'm also hiring uh, junior academics, uh, postdoc, PhD students in my team. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. I'll go back to the first page. So if you like to ask questions. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ray, for your presentation. I have several questions. The first one is um, for your first uh, method, the PMG for implementation, something like uh, you input the uh, UX tree text and generate the uh, kind of image. Mm -hmm. And uh, which scenario do you have to use? Which scenario do you uh, So this one is still being uh, uh, tried. Uh, uh, the the target scenario would be uh, news poster generation. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, it can be used in, in this um, like emoticon generation. Uh, in e-commerce, you can also generate the images for the uh, for the products. Okay, and how about the real time potential cost? Because uh... oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So, stable diffusion uh, takes time, right? So, 
Uh, but uh, with recent advances, uh, it can be reduced to uh, uh, sub, uh, so, so like several uh, milliseconds. So first the performance is improving and uh, uh, you could always use more hardware. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing is uh, we, we can, some of these cases, uh, we we can use the uh, we can compress the model. We can uh, do approximations to to help with the inference time. Uh, yeah, but that that's a good and important point where we also have been questioned by the reviewers. Uh, but but uh, I think it, it's not a it's not a critical problem. Uh, we we can address it. Yeah, so for me, maybe uh, we can it's kind of hybrid method. Uh, for some, we don't need the real time result. We can do the kind of batch generation, mm. and then for just a kind of tiny result, we can use the real time. Yeah, Very of course. Kind of hybrid. Sure. And uh, for the okay, in uh, for this case, I want to ask: Is there any intellectual property problem here? Because we just uh, change the poster or original poster of the. Uh, movie and also for example in e-commerce if you want to change the image and we change the product into another product actually the the style of the store doesn't provide so this could be a problem i think okay so uh again that's a good question but that i think that's a question for all generated contents so it's not just for uh this personalized generation um it even it, it is even for uh for chat gpt right so uh because it's all generated from existing news or uh, uh the contents from the website or the you know worldwide web um it has a lot of the things that come from all the copyrighted uh contents so uh i think that that's a uh question asked to the whole sort of the um, uh, uh, content generation uh, industry, uh, it, it, the solution won't be different here. So that's a problem we have not specifically considered for this particular uh, task. Uh, and the other, uh, the other question you asked about uh, for product, right? Yeah. So um, uh, first, that's the same for, for my first answer. But second, uh, lots of the cases, the the product may not have an image. Do you understand? So, so maybe, pardon? So the product may not have an image. So let's say uh, a seller uh, on, on uh, Taobao, right? So the seller wants to sell something. Uh, this person has not taken a photo of the product or has, so the, in our real application, uh, lots of the cases we don't have uh, or, or songs. So we have, uh, you know, a uh, uh, song app like uh, QQ Music or uh, lots of the song app, the song doesn't have an uh, image. So you need to generate an image to, for that song. And uh, that will be uh, uh, very useful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so um, then uh, I finish my session. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we we have a panel talk from uh, online. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you uh, hear my voice? Uh, can you speak again? Uh, uh, can you hear my voice? Uh, maybe uh, the, the sound is not so good. <laughs> okay, it's okay now. It's okay now. Oh, uh, oh okay, okay. Uh, so uh, hello everyone. I'm I'm Chuhan Wu from Huawei. So I, I'm the last speaker. So I will introduce some applications in the industry, and uh, I I will raise several open challenges in multimodal recommendation. Uh, well, so in 
industrial multimodal recommender systems, in my view, we, we care about most of the two the two perspectives. The first one is the fusion the perspective, and the second one is fine tuning. And both perspectives de depend on our system design, and it, 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 these aspects will decide whether we use these features, whether we deploy the model, and whether we, and how we use these systems. So there are two dim dimensions, in, in my opinion. So if we, so the x-axis is the fusion dimension. And if we decide to fuse the multimodal features at the bottom, so we, we, we will pay more attention to the low-level features. And if we, uh, the high-level features, and if we early fuse the multimodal features, and they, we will pay more costs, and the, the fusion is, is more complete, and the performance is really higher. And in industrial systems, we really need to decide whether to fine tune the multimodal uh, understanding model. So some, sometimes we decide to freeze these models and sometimes we need to fine tune the entire model with the entire recommender systems. So the, the, this, in this figure, we can see that we, can, we have four different areas. So in my, in my following discussions, I will discuss the four areas respectively. So uh, let, let's start from the the lower left corner. So in this area, we we, we expect to extract the multimodal embeddings with some pre-trained language models or pre-trained uh, image backbones. So and we we really do not fine tune these models in our systems, and we decide to fuse these multimodal features in very top parts of the model. So this is a late or intermediate fusion. And if we use our system in this manner, the cost is relatively low. And in industrial, this, this method are not too popular because we have many, many machines to deploy our system. So we, we can do more fine tuning. And I noticed that from the Jindo.com work from this year, they use this manner. So, but the key point of this paper does not rely on multimodal understanding. But I noticed that this paper used some uh, uh, backbones such as BERT and ResNet to extract multimodal features and, and just use these multimodal features in their backbone recommender systems. So, but uh, the key idea of this paper is very interesting because it does not use the the original BERT and the original ResNet. This is because that in recommender systems, the, the domain and the applications are very different from the general domain because uh, uh, it, the pre-trained BERT model are pre-trained on many general corpus, for example, the news, the Wikipedia, and uh, books, for example. So but in recommender systems, these types are not, not common. Uh, we, we, we may need to handle many unreal and, uh, and very casual uh, texts. Uh, on the social media and if, for example, it's posted by the, uh, the sellers, right? So if we directly use BERT to extract the text embeddings, the performance may be so so bad, right? And if, for example, for the ResNet backbone, this model is really pre-trained on many popular data sets, for example, ImageNet, and the performance it may also be suboptimal on our product data sets, right? So this adapted these models on their industrial data sets and designed uh, uh, some tasks to, to adapt this model. So they use uh, a query matching task to learn the relevant signal to make the to make birth better capture the relevance between re the query and the document. And for the ResNet backbone, uh, it is adapted on the entity prediction task on some product images based on the the, the 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 product labels right to capture the case entities in these the images so that the both backbones can be better adapted to the recommender system the domain so in the model training the multimodal atom embeddings are pre-extracted so these atom embeddings are freeze during recommendation model training so these the, the embeddings are regarded as separate features as the input of the recommendation model. So in this paper, we can see that uh, from the experiment results, the multimodal features actually can benefit product recommendation. This is very intuitive. And the, uh, a possible 
key insight from the multimodal part is that the adapted BERT and ResNet are better than the original ones. So we can say that if we if we directly use the original foundation models, the performance may not be so good. And uh, even if we do not fine tune the model along with the recommender system, usually we need to adapt these basic backbones on our data sets and products so that the performance can be better. And uh, a popular manner is the, the upper left area. So we really need to fine tune some parts of the model or the embeddings, or just a part of the models, but we do, we do not feel the multi-model embeddings in, in very bottom of the, the, the models. So this method can, can, can be widely used by industry. So for example, the DICM model proposed by Alibaba, uh, the, in this work, the image embedding model is, is in fact called the embedding model in this paper. And it is actually part of the VGG network. So we can see that if we directly fine tune such a large backbone at, at that age, so if we directly fine tune that model uh, along with the recommender system, we can see that if we need to uh, simultaneously handle the ad image and the user behavior image. And the user behavior image is actually a sequence of image. So the computational cost and the memory cost is very huge. So in fact, we, we can see that this, this paper proposed a uh, model server to handle the, handle the, the model training. So it, it, the basic idea of this, uh, this model from our, uh, from our recent perspective is just a split learning, right? So it, it, we use a model server to, can, to learn the embedding model and other parts can be learned separately because the, if these embeddings are extracted by the model, we can just propagate the, the gradients based on these embeddings and just propagate the, the gradient of the embeddings to the embedding model. So different parts can, can be decomposed, right? So from the, the, the architecture of this model, different parts can be, can be decomposed because they, they, they are just very simple modules. So that in this way, the storage and communication costs can be, uh, can be greatly reduced. And the, the, from, the, from the past figure, we can see that there is a, a great gator in the model. So we can see that in this paper, they propose to use a multi-query attentive pooling to aggregate different image embeddings. So you know, it also shows that it, it, they compare different methods, for example, concatenation and some or max pooling, attentive pooling, or multi-query attentive pooling. So for, for example, from the red figure, they use they concatenate the, the query vector to the key vectors, and they use uh, 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 several MLP layers to compute the attention weight, and then add it, and they multiply the attention weight on the value uh, the value vector. So the, in in this way, the com the computation of the, the attention weights may be more accurate because they use more layers to compute the attention weights. So the the, uh, the selection of the key key and the value vectors may be more, may be better, right? So from experiments of this paper, we can see that image signals may be very strong in some scenarios, uh, because from the the, the the table three, we can see that uh, the, the baseline model uh, is original system, and if we directly use add image. And we do not use other features, so we can see that the performance is, is actually very good. So it, it shows that the, the multimodal features are very important in advertisement systems. So, and we can see that the model server can actually balance the, the cost of storage and, and the communication. If we directly store the, the model in, in either all workers or, or, or in the servers, the storage or communication costs are uh, usually, usually huge. So if we, if we use the system like split learning and use the model server to train the entire model, the both the storage and communication costs can be effectively reduced. And uh, from the, the ablation study on the aggregator, we can see that uh, usually attentive pooling is really help, helpful. 
uh, but the performance difference between the standard attentive pooling and the multi-query attentive pooling is usually not so significant. So we, we, we can see that if your data is sufficiently large and uh, the model is actually, if your model is actually very strong, so the difference between different attention mechanisms may, may not be so significant. And uh, we, I, I will introduce the next work is is from Tencent, uh, and this is actually based on uh, the semi networks. So the task is just uh, the music recommendation, right? So it, it, in this case, we need to hand do the audio of the music. So in this work, the authors propose to model the music information from music audios. So they directly use the audio signal as the input of the model and use several MLP layers to learn the hidden features of the, 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 the actually the, the, the music items, right? So they directly from the low level features to learn the item embedding. And they use DSSM-like architectures to learn the user and audio embeddings. So in, in the user part, the authors usually use other lookup embeddings of the features to learn user preferences. And they aggregate different kinds of features, such as the recent listening tracks, recent listening al albums, and some artists, and, and, and well as some demographic features to fuse the user embeddings. And from the red part is the uh, is audio and, or the music part. So the user use contrast, the authors use contrastive learning to to uh, make the users embeddings close to the actually liked track the embedding uh, and be more departure from uh, other tracks. So uh, from, from this method, we can see from the experiments, we can see that the longer audio context really yields better performance. This is because if we learn the audio embedding from the, the, the for example, first uh, for several first three seconds, or first 10 seconds, the, the performance may, may have become different because the beginning of the music may not uh, contain sufficient information about the style or the content, right? So if we have sufficient computation, computational uh, uh, badges, we can use longer uh, longer context windows to extract the audio features, right? So we, we, we have several interesting findings from the experiment uh, about the contrastive learning part. We can see that if we use one negative sample, we can see that the, the, the performance uh, in terms of uh, AOC, is it, it really uh, may, may may not be so good as if we use more negative samples, but the the precision is consistently much better than the the case we if we use four negative samples. So this this may be a lesson to us. If we only optimize the AOC score and use just for those the uh, the standard setting if. Uh, that is, we use four negative samples in our systems. Uh, maybe the AOC score is is good, but there may harm some other metrics. So, uh, in our in industrial settings, we need to pay more attention to different metrics and select the number of negative samples more carefully. And then I will introduce this work again. This work is actually introduced by other speakers, but I would like to introduce again because this is very representative. And this is what you use category embeddings to customize the image embedding. And this is very interesting, right? Because if uh, in most systems we need, we may prefer to use category features as separate features, and we just combine the visual embedding. Uh, with with the uh, category embeddings, right? But in this work, it shows that if we use category embedding to customize the the learning of image embedding, the performance may be better. the The key idea of this paper is you use the category embedding to to compute the spatial attention or the temporal uh, or the channel wise that is the temporal uh, attention. To customize the, the imaging embedding and combine the different methods in the model, so this is a deeper fusion between the ch channel between the the same channel embedding and the category embedding, right? So uh, the different different model modalities are actually slightly better fused, right? So um, 
uh, both uh, in this way, both the image and other features in model training can be better combined. And in this method, CN features can be cached in online servings. So the computational cost is actually not high. And from the experimental results, we can see that the critical information can help learn better image representations. So this is very interesting, right? So, and, and from the method, we can see that the proposed method can be used to enhance other vision backbones. For example, from the, the, from the lower table, we can see that if we add the proposed CSN method to other backbones, the performance can be consistently improved. So we, we can see that this is very, the idea is very interesting and, uh, and can be generalized to different methods. So if you would like to fuse your image embedding with your kit grids, we can consider using some low level methods to directly inject the kit grid knowledge into the image representation learning. And then I will introduce the, the lower right part. This is a very interesting area because we, and many methods have already used this, uh, this paradigm in industrial system because we can extract the unified multimodal embeddings with some precision models. And we can free these multimodal models to save the computational cost, right? But due to the, the size of the, the modern pre-trained multimodal models, the cost is already very high, but uh, uh, if we do not fine tune the models, the, the cost may not be so so acceptable. So uh, 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 a very representative method I like to introduce is uh, is a method based on the adaptive clip proposed by Baidu. So this method is actually uh, a VLM uh, VLM based framework for uh, for recall, right? So this method is very interesting because they first pre-train pre the click model on some vision MLM task on, uh, on their corpus so that the general model can be adapted to the, the, the domain specific scenarios. For example, the, the, some relevance, uh, domain relevance computation tasks, right? So, and, and then they will fine tune the relevance model on, on a high quality as domain data. This is because the high quality as domain data is the, the, the size of the corpus is very limited because this, this may, may be uh, sometimes in some scenarios, this may be manually annotated, right? So the size of this data may not be, may not be sufficient, and, but the, the quality is very high. So they first train and fine tune the relevance model on this data, and they freeze the image encoder. And this is very interesting because if you fine tune the image encoder, the, the knowledge may, may, may be frequently updated, right? So the understanding of the image may be biased to some domains on data sets. And they do not, since they freeze the image encoder and they, they only fine tune the text encoder with three layers. So this is, is very interesting, right? And, and they try to distill the knowledge of the re relevance model on the full data. The full data is very noisy and very large and the, 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 label, the label may not be uh, high quality, in high quality, right? So they, they can learn from the high quality relevance model and they use the, the contrastive learning loss on the, 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 the full data. So the, the, the entire model may be, learned, may be learned from more knowledge from the, the relevance model uh, distilled on the, the, the high quality data. And the distribution between the high quality data and the noisy data can be better aligned, right? So in, in, in this way, the, 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 the large model can learn more knowledge and the, the, the actually they, they can also exploit the, the, the small size and high quality data. And in, in, in this way, we, we, we can do not waste, waste the high quality data because the size of different data can, can be diverse, right? And we can, from the results, we can see that the adapted click model really outperforms the base model on both general and the industrial data sets. It's very interesting because uh, if we adapted the click model on some domain specific data sets, the performance of this model can be stronger than the original model on general data sets. This is very interesting, right? Because the domain specific data 
and you really have some domain gaps with the general data. For example, their search advertising and e-commerce data may have some gaps with the, the, the general Wukong and the uh, MS Coco data set threat. So th this may be uh, a lesson to us that uh, uh, the original pre-training data for the backbone models, for example, Clip, may also be biased because the collection of the data may, may usually focus on some scenarios, for example, uh, maybe the off-door uh, scenes and uh, some uh, the objectives uh, and so on, right? So the, the, the collection of the general data may also be biased. And if we adapt the model on some domain-specific data, but the, the, the collection of this data may be very diverse. So they, they may contain the knowledge of the world, right? So if we adapt the model on this data, the performance of this general model may be stronger, right? So, and from the right, right figure, we can see that the knowledge distillation can also help the model learning on very large scale noisy data. So if we can see that if we only learn the model on the, the noisy data, the, the, the performance is not optimal, right? So if we use uh, an additional relevance model to teach the, the, the model fine-tuning on the noisy data, the performance may be better, right? So this paper is very interesting. And finally, uh, let, let's go to the, uh, the, the, the upper right part. So this part is not very widely used in industrial systems because the, co the cost is very high. But uh, if we do not fine tune a large model, the performance is also acceptable. But uh, while the, the performance may, may not be so good as if we uh, directly fine tune the, the pre trained foundation model. And in, in this part, we really learn unified multi model embeddings uh, directly by the, the, the basic foundation model and really update parts of the multi model models. And in fact, the atmosphere stage method falls in this category because. In this method, they, they usually directly learn the transformer encoder to based on the low-level features of the, the text and the images, right? So if the transformer encoder is very large, the computational cost is very high, right? So the, but in this paper, they use a single-layer transformer and encoders, and they find the performance is also satisfactory. So this may be because the, uh, the model size is not so large, and the, the hash embedding and or the pin stage embedding on the uh, on, on the image may have already lost many semantic features, so they, they do not need to use very deep transformers to capture the very deep semantics, right? So uh, from this figure, we can see that the text features and the image embeddings uh, are fused by the transformer encoder, and this is a very simple method, and they will use the CLS embedding as the final unified uh, feature uh, as the uh, item, right? So this, this feature will be further transformed by some linear layers and into the item stage embedding. And in this, this work, they also uh, find the model in different tasks. For example, there may be uh, some click prediction tasks, save prediction tasks, and add to cart uh, prediction tasks, and some check final checkout uh, prediction tasks, right? So there are many different tasks. And in different tasks, they also use a mixed negative sampling strategy uh, because there are maybe some uh, very, very easy uh, randomly selected negatives, and some uh, negatives that come from the in-batch uh, sampled negatives, right? So for, for the model training, both the type, uh, two types of negative samples are fused together to compute different uh, loss functions. So the models are, are, are trained on different tasks. And this is a very standard negative sampling strategy in industrial, right? And uh, from the experimental results, we can see that atom stage can achieve better results in various different tasks. And we can see that from the experimental results, deeper transformer models may not help in the uh, different tasks, right? For example, we can see that uh, atom stage use uh, uh, only a single layers and compared with the real results, if we use two layers, three layers, or four layers, the, the performance does not change significantly, right? So we can see that in this framework, if we use deeper and larger models, the performance may not have some 
uh, significant change, right? But the, the, from, the experiment in recent years, we can see that if we use larger models and we increase the hidden size of the model, uh, rather than directly change the, the, the layer of the transformers, the performance may have some different uh, scaling loss, right? And, and we can see that from the red features, the, feature, the, the features of the you know, the input and the task sig signals are, are very important, right? If we use different types of features and you com there are different combinations and we use the uh, different negative sampling strategies, the performance may change, change significantly, right? And if we use different en engagement types, such as click saves or different uh, uh, such tasks such as uh, checkouts, right? So the, the different supervision signals may have very a huge impact on the uh, final performance. So we, in, in our industrial architecture systems, we need to uh, carefully select the features and negative sampling strategies and the, the, the incoming signals to train our model. And in, in, from uh, Microsoft, there is a method named MMREX to, uh, for neutral condition. And this method is very straightforward. Um, because it, it is just fine tuning well and during, during model training, and they use different multi model embeddings to ma match candidate news and the historical clicks news. And uh, for, for this method, we can see that uh, if, if we directly uh, fine tune the, the, the entire Wilbert model, and the computational cost may be very huge in some large scale render systems, right? So we need, we need sufficient GPUs to to for model training and sufficient uh, GPU, GPU for model inference, right? So, uh, but from the experimental results, we can see that uh, the image signals also have some uh, some uh, have some in, also some improvements in terms of AOC and DCG, right? And but in new conditions, the most important feature is actually the text modality, right? For example, the news title rather than use the image. This is very different from the advertisement, right? And uh, from the experimental results, we can see that if we use the fine grid matching between different multimodal embeddings, the performance may be better than using the direct matching between the single modality. So for example, if we can model the relevance between text and the images, the performance may be better. And finally, I, I would like to introduce some open challenges in multimodal recommendation. And in my perspective, the major challenges can be summarized in, in the, the five, five, eight. The, the, this is very interesting, right? Because we can see that there are, these the, the, the challenges are, uh, are set with the alphabet A. And uh, I, I have introduced them, I will introduce them in the following pages. There are alignment, aggregation, adaptation, acceleration, and atmosphere. So the first challenge is alignment. This is very important in the future, uh, the future directions of multimodal recommendation because there must be more modalities and must be more information. And the computational cost and complexity may be expo exponentially increased, right? So you know, as the first, as now we, need, we only process some uh, a subset of the modalities, for example, a uh, text, audio, or image, and, uh, and for all the pre-extracted features from the video, or and and, and there are other types of uh, modalities such as signals or tablet data and so on. So uh, in the future of the recommender system, we need to process more and more modalities, and these modalities may be fused together, right? So how to align so many modalities? This, this is not a trivial problem uh, because if we, uh, we use the, uh, the the text modality as the center, uh, text and and uh, are insufficient to describe many types of modalities, right? So uh, using text as the align 
assignment center may not be uh, an optimal uh, choice, right? So how to uh, align so many modalities and which one should be the best center? And, and if we can choose uh, um, more than one center, right? If, for example, if we directly choose the uh, uh, text and uh, the video as the center, so other modalities need to, uh, to learn to this, learn to uh, close to these modalities, right? So we are known. So how to align, and, and we need to know how to align new modalities to existing ones. And this is motivated by the, the development of GPT-4, GPT-4V, DALI, and uh, the SORA. So uh, if uh, there is an uh, uh, off-the-shelf recommender system with some modalities, and here come some new features in other modalities. So if we would not like to to retrain the entire model, so how to uh, align the new model to, to existing ones? It, this is very challenging, right? So the, the the future direction alignment is a very important challenge. And the second one is aggregation. It, this is a challenge. It, is mainly talking about the, the fusion of one of multimodal information. So recommender systems usually need to fill the representations of different modalities, and different modalities usually have some common commonalities, and sometimes they are very diverse, right? So we cannot simply fuse, uh, just mix the different multimodal features together. This may not be optimal in the future recommender system. And sometimes the early fusion is difficult and very expensive. For example, if we need to uh, have a low level understanding of videos and the fields, the the uh, the context of some text and images, so we we are very hard to fuse them, and we need to pay pay a very high cost for the computation and the, and memory cost, right? So, low level understanding of different modalities are usually very difficult. But uh, their performance is really better than the late fusion. But the uh, late fusion may be very, very, uh, very fast, right? Because they are, they are lightweight, but they may be ineffective. So many, because many use signals have been lost during the, the representation learning of the sing, different single modalities, right? If we, we learn the, the, the text information, or the image information of different products separately, so their relevance and and some uh, fine grain and the relatedness cannot be effectively modeled, right? So uh, we are just fusing. Uh, now we are just pay attention to fusing, for example, two or three different modalities. But in the future, we need to fuse many different kinds of modalities in a single single model. So the, 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 uh, this is very challenging. And the, the, the third open challenge is adaptation. So this is very important because we are now needed to embrace some large foundation models. For example, ChatGPT, right? This is a very large foundation model. And uh, uh, but these foundation models are usually uh, learn on general corpus, right? And they may, may not be optimal on some domain specific scenarios, right? So large foundation models are not naturally recommender system. So we need to teach and uh, adapt these foundation models to the multimodal recommender system. So we need to adapt the precision models in some recommendation task. Or we, on, on, for example, we do not need to directly train them using recommendation data. We can use, contrast some uh, other types of tasks, for example, the relevance prediction task, and for example, the uh, recommendation explanation task, and some, uh, for example, vision, uh, entity re recognition tasks and so on, right? So we can adapt the, the general domain foundation model to a specific domain. And these precision models are usually uh, very large. So how to uh, effectively adapt the, the large foundation model to some domain specific task is not uh, very trivial, right? It's very important. And how to develop good tasks and data to adapt these large foundation models to some novel tasks and domains is also a challenging problem. So this is very important for the performance of the, uh, the large foundation model in downstream tasks. And we need to ensure that the design of the data and tasks do not uh, make the catastrophe uh, uh, forget of the, 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 the rich knowledge of these foundation models, right? And the, the next challenge is acceleration because 
the scaling law uh, is, is showing powerful impact on the LP and other fields. Uh, so, and, and some uh, pioneer studies also show that the in recognition system field, there are also some scaling laws. So, so we, are, we are facing uh, an area of the big model, right? So the model must be more and larger and larger. And but the, given the tolerance of the, the latency, right? So the inference must be faster and faster, right? So if we use a larger model, and the computational cost is it must be larger, right? So the inf this is a very high challenge to the the inference of the uh, the online system. So the multi model mo and for for example the multi model models that usually have e even higher computational cost than the single model the foundation models, for example language models, right? So this large and this larger foundation model may may cost of super high cost than the than the traditional the traditional recognition models, right? So we need to accelerate the multi models to meet our latency requirements. So there are many different methods for acceleration, for example, distillation, quantization, and compression. And for example, in the language model, we can use KV cache, right? And we, we can use some speculative decoding techniques. And for example, we can use the, the, some the sparse activation using the mixture of experts and so on, so, right? So we, uh, if we can accelerate the large foundation model, to an accepted cost uh, in industrial recognition systems, then the recognition system can uh, can uh, maximally uh, embrace the large large language models, right? And the the, the, the finally uh, uh, a very important perspective is atmosphere. So how to embrace the the flaw of AIGC in recognition systems? Because uh, ma many content. Maybe AI, AI generated, right? So the, uh, the there may be a huge influence of this AI, AIGC on some content delivery platforms because uh, some users can use AI tools to create better content in a much shorter time, right? But uh, also uh, some risks, right? Because the users can uh, can intentionally use some tools to uh, to create so so many videos and post them to uh, some uh, some video platform to pollute the the video uh, system, right? So so uh, and and in some experiments. Experiments also show that there are uh, maybe our web content have been heavily polluted by some AIGC results, right? So the content ecosystem have have in fact heavily affected by AIGC, and the the content and the quality of this content may also be diverse, right? Some AIGC may be in high quality because they may be edited by humans, but some may may, may be very low. And they, they may, may may be pollute the the web, right? So the content delivery platforms may face high challenges to the, the, the flaws of AIGC, and they need to better moderation the content, and uh, better they, they may need to design some uh, strategy to to identify AIGC so that the user the purely user generated content can be distinguished from AIGC, right? And the, the influence of AIGC also has some impact uh, on the recommendation algorithms, right? Because the distribution of AIGC is really different from UGC, right? So, uh, and there are maybe some difficult to balance the exposure chance of AIGC and UGC. And some studies also show that some um, recommendation models or maybe large language models may prefer AIGC than, than UGC. This is their self bias, right? So, if AIGC Get more and more chances to uh, to be uh, recommended in the system. Then the, uh, the the incentive of the the UGC creators is is, is just a very important problem, right? So the, the the ecosystem is maybe heavily affected by this heavy bias, right? So we do not uh, we do not like to see this bias in our systems, and we we we. We expect the AIGC and UGC are, are fairly uh, regarded based on their quality, right? And so this is very important to, to prevent any recommender system to generate some bias or unfairness on AIGC or UGC. 
And finally, it also affects users because uh, this is very, very important to a topic in, in, in to study in, in the future because the AIGC may be used to intentionally distort users' perceptions and views. And th this can be intentional, but and may be uh, controlled by some in, intentional uh, persons or organizations, right? And, and due to the hallucination of the, the large language models or large foundation models, the, uh, the generative content may also be uh, not so, so responsible, right? So AIGC may not be so responsible than the high quality uh, UGC, right? So, uh, but, but normal users can not, cannot effectively identify whether the content is generated by user or generated by AI, right? So our perception and even views about the world can be distorted, right? So this is very dangerous. So in, in the future, we must have some, uh, take some actions and uh, uh, so, uh, and for the study, the influence of AIGC on the perception perception of the users, and uh, uh, so that we can you know, we, we can early fi find that uh, and control and the the influence of AIGC, so that uh, uh, the, the ecosystem between uh, the platform user and the content creator and so on, and and maybe the AIGC provider, right? So the the, the, the there may, may be a better. Uh, harmony between the, the different uh, uh, different sides, right? So, in, in, in the future, the, the recommended system must be pay attention. Must pay attention to more more to the atmosphere of, of the entire ecosystem. Okay, so my my part is, is finished here. Uh, okay, so thank you all of you. So, any, any questions? I will turn to this page. Uh, hi, Suhan. I'm interested in what you have talked about. Uh, the... can, you, can you hear the question? Can you hear me? Uh, okay, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm interested about uh, the early fusion and the late fusion in multi-model recommendation. So um, which one do you think is better in uh, when we want to integrate the multi-model um, features with the last and models, and why? Okay, okay, this is a very important problem, and and uh, in, in my opinion, I think if the large language model is is strong enough, for example, uh, if we use a very large language model to 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 extract the multi-model features. So the the large large language model and or the large larger multimodal models have a very deep understanding of the features, and we have already adapted the general domain model to a specific domain. Then I think early fusion is a better choice if the the latency or the computation on the or the computational cost is acceptable, right? So it, 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 because they must or they usually yield better performance. And we can use some sophisticated design tasks to better adapt the, the general uh, large multiple models to a, to a specific domain. And we may not need to further fine tune the model along with the recommender system, right? So we, we can also stay, the, uh, stay in the lower right area, right? But if the model is not so strong because uh, the model may not have a deep understanding and between different uh, di different images, different texts, and do not store the sufficient knowledge of about the world, right? So, for example, a very small model. Uh, uh, so, so in these cases, I, I I think early fusion may not be so good because the model may need to, may 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 be so struggle in modeling the low level features of some vision signals, for example, image or videos. So the the optimization. Of the model is is insufficient and biased towards some low level task, and and the parameters may not have sufficient spaces to 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 capture sufficient knowledge in the recommendation recommendation task, right? So in these cases, I think if we use some uh, pre extracted embeddings, there may be a better choice in your system, and in these cases, your latency is more controllable. So uh, at the at the current stage. Many recommended systems prefer late, late or intermediate fusion, and but in, in the future, and if, if we have more and more computational resources, and the, 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 
the language models are, uh, and small uh, large language models um, become more and more stronger and, and more stronger, right? For example, Lama 3 is very strong, right? right? And even only the 8, 8, 8 b size is very strong, right? So if uh, in the future, the la small large language models or or uh, or, or if you can use large, large language models at other times, they are very if they are very strong. Uh, I think early theory may be a better choice in our system. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Chuan. Uh, this is the ending of our tutorial. Uh, if you have any other further questions, uh, you can discuss with us offline. Uh, thank you for attending. <laughs>